Yes. Okay. Right open now. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, morning. Welcome, well, welcome to the weekly meeting of the Yellow Committee. Um, we're recorded here. Everybody's online, and we're all appropriately seated and distanced. Uh, the meeting will include today a briefing from the Permanent Secretary on the, the transition programme and an update on the Internal Market Bill. Uh, members will also receive an update on the Fisheries Bill, the EU Exit Update and Second Legislation, as well as a briefing on the Common Organisation of the Markets in Agriculture Producers and the Agriculture Payments Regulations. Claire, uh, uh, Morris and Harry and Patsy Malone will be joined in the meeting by the Secretary, although I think Claire has sent her apologies. She has, she yes. Has I, I sent you a revised copy. Oh, did you? Yes, sir. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, Okay. Um, okay, so apologies from Claire, right? So, uh, next item then. Um, I want to advise members that the staff and the communications office have worked with the department to ensure that this week's um, uh, study sessions are working adequately and that any accessible issues have been uh, resolved. A test call was made with all the department officials this week and all managed to access study with no problems. Uh, we can hope, therefore, today that all the officials uh, will be able to access the full Starleaf app today. Um, the minutes of the last meeting uh, held on the 17th of September at page 6 to 12 of your packs. Uh, can I seek agreement for me to sign those minutes? Yeah. Okay. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Uh, any matters arising? Patrick? Yeah, Patrick, go for it. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Chair, just in light of the, the issues that are surrounding some of, some of the discussion we're having today, is um, Assembly Legal Services, have they been accessed in relation to today's meeting um, uh, to, to advise us on, on the way forward and to oversee uh, the proceedings? They are aware that we may be coming to them after the meeting for advice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Patrick, yeah they, they may be aware that we'll be, we'll be coming to them seeking advice after the meeting. Okay. After the meeting? Yeah. yeah. I, I, are they, um, sorry, sorry for being specific about this, but um, has the meeting been hand started, is it? No, but it's recorded. It's recorded. Some of the meetings. So, are, no, that's what I'm trying to get to the bottom of. Are, will they uh, look at the recording then, Stella? Is that the idea? Yes. 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 Okay. No, that's grand. That's okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, item five then, we have an oral briefing uh, from Dara. The transition programme and update on the uh, internal um, market bill. Um, I want to refer to members. There's a memo from the clerk at page 15 to 16, a written briefing at 17 to 23, um, and on the internal market bill at 24 to 28, um, and uh, the actual bill itself is page 29 to 80, with explanatory notes at page 81 to 120, and correspondence from the permanent secretary and the recommendations from the recent Gateway Review and Dear Transition programme. At pages 121 to 124 and member members will recall um, that at last week's meeting it was agreed to write to the department to request the premise secretary provides answers to the following questions which arose from the internal market bill briefing uh, members like to know if the views expressed up to paragraph 22 are held by those of dear um held by dear members raise concerns around paragraph 14 which in their view could lead to uh, the north becoming a back door to the uk market Members are concerned about the possible impact of the internal market bill on their protocol in the event of a no-deal scenario. And members express concern around the implications of the internal market bill and state aid on the agri-food sector and how the bill will operate on uh, an island-wide basis. I'd like this opportunity at this point to welcome the Permanent Secretary, Dennis McMahon, and the Chief Veterinary uh, Offer, um, Officer Ra Robert Huey. And via Starleaf, we have um, Norman Fulton, Head of Food and Farming Group, and Mark Livingston, Director of Operation and Readiness, Food Supply Security. And uh, Dennis, I'd like to take this opportunity then to uh, invite you to commence the briefing. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so I've, I very much appreciate your invitation to come to the committee today. And uh, as I'm sure you'll be aware from the media reports and from other sources, post-Brexit uh, trade issues have gained significant profile in recent weeks and months. This is entirely to be expected given the proximity of the end of the transition period. On the 4th of June, I provide, provided an update on the SPS operational delivery programme. It's my intention to provide a further update on that element of the overall transition programme today, but set in the context of a broader debate. 
In doing so, I recognise that colleagues have been providing you with verbal and written evidence on various aspects of the programme. I do not intend to replicate these regular updates here, but first I want to put my thanks on record my thanks to the Committee for your support and challenge. This is an unprecedented programme of work, both in scale and complexity, and I am very conscious of the pressures that it places on the Era Committee as it does on the Department. I had highlighted previously the importance of the UK and the EU working together to support delivery. While we've had a great deal of support from counterparts in Whitehall, particularly the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, ODEFRA, it's important to say that we still lack a great deal of clarity on key issues which are central to our ability to deliver an effective outcome for the people of Northern Ireland. To some extent, this is to be expected uh, in the midst of international negotiations, but it is important to put on record that the lack of clarity is having, an is having and will have real consequences on the ground. I'll come back to this point as we progress through the issues. With your agreement, I'll focus on the, the opening remarks on those issues which I expect you will be most interested in, specifically the overall programme delivery assessment, the trade negotiations, the UK Internal Market Bill, as well, of course, as the SPS Operational Delivery Programme. Starting off with the Gateway Review, on the 4th of June, I informed the Committee of my intention as senior responsible owner to take forward an independent Gateway Review on the Department's transition programme. At that time, I committed to coming back to the Committee with the outcome of that review. The Gateway, in this case, a programme assessment review, PAR, looked at the DERA transition programme. It made recommendations on delivering a minimum viable product and on how to focus efforts in, a very short time, in the very short time available. The review also included a delivery confidence assessment. The PAR ran remotely over four days from the 25th to 20, 28th of August 2020. It was carried out by an external review team who conducted 17 interviews with a range of people, including myself as SRO, the DERA Brexit and SPS Transitional Operational Readiness Directors, DERA Senior Management and external stakeholders. The Gateway team has now reported and I can confirm that the delivery confidence assessment is read meaning that successful delivery of the programme appears to be unachievable. Delivery of transition requirements is unachievable through this de delivery vehicle. Urgent intervention is required to ensure contingency arrangements are mobilised and are adequate to deliver the intended outcome. You'll recall, you will recall when I spoke to you on the 4th of June, I said my, de my delivery confidence assessment at that stage was red amber. This reflected the incredible time pressures associated with the programme, the lack of clarity on key issues of relevance to the programme due to the ongoing trade negotiations and the political and operational complexities. I've already sent you a summary of the review, including the recommendations, but it's worth probably just covering them very briefly with your agreement. The seven recommendations are recommendation one, thoroughly re-examine the current planning assumptions, testing their accuracy and define a detailed minimum achievable product as opposed to uh, viable product for the 1st of January 2021. Contingency plans also need to be immediately developed and implemented, and we're doing that. Urgently seek an agreed definition of unfettered access and Northern Ireland qualifying goods and businesses with the UK government. Front load resources into the policy, sorry, I should have said recommendation three, is front load resources into the policy and legislation drafting teams in order to effectively tackle the large volume of work which needs to be conducted at pace. Explore the opportunities for introducing additional time in the Assembly for legislative scrutiny, and we've begun the engagement with you on that. Recommendation four, develop a trader readiness communications campaign with DFE, DEFRA, and HMRC. Number five, review and update no, tr no trade deal contingency plans. Number six, produce a decision and approval matrix aligned with the critical path. And number seven, review and update the risk register and mitigation plans in line with the, the revised scope of the minimum achievable product. In addition to the recommendations, the review team did note a number of positives, including highly committed leadership, the work, the hard work being carried out by the DARA team, against pressures of time and within constraints imposed by the uncertain outcome of the trade talks with the EU, considerable challenges including COVID-19 and the broader politi political complexities, and the hard work and integrity of the team in the approach to communication and engagement. In summary, the Gateway team felt that we should do what we can do in the very limited time available. So work has begun on implementing the, imp the recommendations with immediate effect, and the Department will be happy to provide you with further updates on this in the next few weeks. Moving on to some of the other areas. On the UK Internal Market Bill. On the bill, you've received a separate written update. 
Clearly, the bill has not made its way through all stages of par Parliament, and we will have to await the version that passes into law before the precise impact on the Northern Ireland Protocol can be assessed. I think it's important to say we are not. Uh, this is not being led by us. This is led by DEFRA and the UK government, and um, we are watching with great interest this as much as everybody else is. It is also important to state that the relevant clauses in the bill do not actually change the Northern Ireland Protocol, rather they give discretionary power to the Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, or BASE, Secretary of State, to bring forward regulations to make changes. Whether any such regulations will be brought forward, precisely what they would change, and whether they would be approved by Parliament remains to be seen. On the trade negotiations, I have no doubt you have seen media reports on the progress of the UK-EU negotiations. The eighth round of the negotiations concluded on the 11th of September 2020, and both sides met again last week in Brussels. Your interpretation of this is as good as mine, but it appears that significant differences remain, particularly around fisheries and how to maintain a level playing field, although I do understand there's, there's some good engagement. Um, going on, and so it's important just to to, uh, to be aware that unless you're in the negotiations, there's a limit to how much you can um, we can really interpret from the, the public messages. On unfettered market access, clearly the issue of unfettered access from Northern Ireland to Great Britain is hugely important for the agri-food industry, the wider business sector, and wider society. <coughs> Accordingly, the minister continues to make all possible representations to the UK government. <clears throat> to ensure that Northern Ireland achieves the best possible outcome on market access to GB that is completely unfettered and which will not only allow status quo trade to continue but enable our build businesses to build market share in GB in the future and crucially make sure that they, they are able to differentiate their products, that, uh, that we, we don't have problems with be, the market being undermined. On other issues, I will not attempt to improve on Rosemary Agnew's excellent updates on the issues around legislation, common frameworks and communications. <coughs> the only point I would make is that we now need to move into an intensive period of communications with all stakeholders, so it is very important that we receive further clarifications from the UK Government as we approach the end of the transition period. Rosemary Agnew will be providing a further update on the secondary legislation programme later this morning. And that brings me to the SPS Operational Delivery Programme. There has been some media coverage on the SPS operational delivery programme in recent weeks, and I would be very happy to answer any questions you may have on this today. But first, it might be worth setting out the context to help you understand what is happening. It is always useful to start by reminding ourselves of the basis of any programme. The legislative basis for the SPS operational delivery programme is the Official Controls Regulation, or OCR. The requirements as set out in the OCR are part of domestic law as a result of Article 5.4 of the Northern Ireland Protocol and Section 7A of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. Under the OCR, DERA is responsible for sanitary and phytosanitary SPS checks on certain goods coming into Northern Ireland, and Robert will be happy to talk about that in more detail um, in a moment. Following the UK Government's command paper on the protocol dated 20th of May 2020, I was appointed as senior responsible owner for this programme on 26th of May 2020. This meant we had seven months to deliver the people, processes, IT and facilities at Northern Ireland points of entry necessary to provide SPS checks in compliance with our legal responsibilities, which in turn meant having point of entry facilities designated by the European Union at Belfast, Larne, Warren Point and Foyle ports and also the Northern Ireland airports, along with the necessary processes, IT capabilities and personnel. The purpose of this is to enable the continued importation of animal and plant products, plants and live animals, is to protect public animal and plant health and support businesses bringing food, animal and plant products into Northern Ireland from GB. Having seven months to deliver all of this has been a monumental challenge. In operational terms, there are a range of issues which have had the, from the beginning the potential to derail the schedule. For example, physical constraints at the sites. Even without these kinds of delays, the deadline was almost impossible. I would like, therefore, to pay tribute to my colleagues in the programme team and Mark's here today. Um, to, who have been, and Robert's been working, uh, his team's been working really closely with them, who have been working extremely long hours to meet these significant demands. Importantly, there are very significant issues to be addressed through political processes. The Minister's position has been clear from the beginning that the Northern Ireland Protocol needs to be implemented in a way that minimises any frictions on the flow of agri food trade and works for our businesses and citizens. He is also clear about the need for a legally binding framework which ensures continued unfettered access for Northern Ireland businesses to their key market in Great Britain. 
However, I think it's important to say that the Minister is very clearly opposed, and he has made that statement to, this, uh, to, to the programme moving ahead. And um, we'll talk about some of the reasons. Obviously, there are bigger political reasons, which I won't go into here. I think they speak for themselves, but there are also some, some very practical issues. In operational terms, the Minister's approach um, that, he is, that he has taken to this going ahead is minimising the need for physical checks and therefore a reduction in the scale of some of the facilities required. But the Minister's position in terms of minimising frictions is shared by the UK Government as set out in his command paper published on the 20th of May 2020. The Minister has been engaging with the UK Government on these issues, in particular in relation to food retail movements, the need for a risk-based approach on checks and the need to avoid costs which be, would be incurred by businesses and consumers. To put this in context, a supermarket lorry travelling today without any facilitations could have some 400 products which would need to be certified on it. In that context, we can implement what we like, but without help from the UK and the EU to simplify the processes involved, we will not be able to deliver the level of frictionless trade that we have today. These and other matters, both in terms of UK and EU policy, continue to be addressed through our colleagues in DEFRA. So it's important to say we're doing this, we're doing this work. The Minister is keen that we do the minimisation work, but that does not remove his, his fundamental opposition to the issue. So resolving policy issues such as these will be absolutely essential to the design and running of the points of entry. There are two further very significant unresolved issues at this time, namely the status of third country listing to enable GB agri-food products to be moved into Northern Ireland and the status of information technology needed to, in order to support checks. Robert and Mark can talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> so it is entirely justifiable for the Minister to seek to secure clarity on these and other issues through political processes. Indeed, under normal circumstances, we would have far more time than we have been granted in order to provide the space for the Minister to do this. In this case, however, for reasons outside the control of DERA, none of us has been granted the time necessary to build in the outcome of the negotiations. We still aren't there. We still haven't got the outcome of those negotiations. So notwithstanding this lack of clarity in the wider political and negotiation landscape, work has continued at pace since we last updated you. In order to secure and commit expenditure from HM Treasury, we needed to prepare an outline business case. <clears throat> Our preferred option, negotiated minimisation, is to procure uh, facilities for physical checks, ensuring that the capacity of such facilities reflects both our Minister's wishes and the UK Government's policy to minimise checks within the spirit of the Northern Ireland Protocol. These plans take into account facilitations which would reduce the need for documentary and ID checks of the goods to be carried out at points of entry. It means, for example, that we do not have currently have plans for parking areas necessary to undertake those checks. The plans could, however, be amended to reflect the outcome of the discussions between the UK and the EU. I'm very pleased to note that approval to spend on the basis of the business case was achieved on the 10th of August 2020 from uh, HM Treasury and Department of Finance. This is subject to normal approval conditions and reflects the fact that further iterations of the business case will be required as the programme moves forward. Indeed, the costs reflect this, and just the current costs are for the preferred option are approximately 45 million, with some 38 million uh, required for upfront capital expenditure and around six million of revenue will be required for recruiting, training, employing additional personnel and programme implementation costs. The option which we have chosen, which is consistent with the Minister's approach, would save £14 million per annum from the maximum. But again, it's important to say, until we have contractors appointed, um, we'll be able to, we'll to finalise these costs more effectively. One of the most significant aspects of the programme has been identify suitable site locations for point of entry facilities. These are they are key drivers for the site selection. For example, they must be within the port and customs boundary. They must fit the needs of DERA operating model in terms of the size, and they must and to be successful, they have to align with the port's operating model. There has been detailed engagement with port authorities and airports to one assess the current site infrastructure, two identify any additional infrastructures required, and three agree in principle, suitable site locations. After a period of intensive work, I'm nearly finished, sorry Chair, if you forgive me, I think it's <coughs> worth giving the committee a bit of, bit of a different, additional briefing on this. After a period of intensive work, specific sites have now been identified and the programme team is in negotiations with the ports through land and property services and DSO commercial to secure the relevant lease agreements. 
Proposed facilities will, of course, need to have the relevant planning consents to proceed, and we believe that the proposals can be considered as permitted development by the programme team. However, legal advice has been that DERA should confirm this with the local planning authorities. Certificates of lawful use or development, CLUDs as they're called, were submitted to the relevant councils on the 15th of September 2020. A tender was issued for the design and build of facilities on the 17th of December of September 2020. On IT and people, <coughs> the process IT and, purple, uh, and people work streams, we've undertaken the development of proposals to support the negotiated minimisation, and we are seeking to resolve these work streams through negotiations with DEFRA. It will be crucial, for example, to minimise the impact on, on food retailers. We will, receive, we will present further details on these matters in due course, but I'm sure you'll understand that they're subject to negotiations. On the provision of IT, the EU Commission has indicated that the previously acceptable approach of using a UK national system, IPAFs, for supporting the SPS regime will not now be acceptable and we're working very closely to look at alternatives. DERA is currently de um, developing an approach with DEFRA colleagues using the existing EU Traces NT system supported by uh, DERA colleagues. Further details will be provided on that in the coming weeks. Whilst recruitment exercises are in place, the challenging time frame means we're looking at redeployment of existing people to make this happen. On other work, the programme team has completed the point of entry applications for Belfast City and Belfast International Airports and provided the additional points of clarification requested by the EU Chief Veterinary Officer on the original applications previously made by DEFRA on the 30th of June. These are to be sent to the EU Commission via DEFRA shortly. So, you'd be glad to know I'm coming to an end. Um, my message to you today is that despite monumental efforts by the team, not everything will be in place by the 1st of January 2021. The Minister is opposed for legitimate reasons to uh, what we're doing or for political reasons to what we're doing and also has some legit legitimate concerns about our operational, uh, the operational issues as well. We now need the UK Government with the EU to help us make this work for the benefit of everyone who lives and works in Northern Ireland. And in the meantime, we will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dennis, for that very uh, comprehensive briefing. And um, we, have men we have members here who have some questions to ask. Um, I suppose there's a couple of points. Um, uh, just in relation to the, just the last thing you mentioned, I think you mentioned there was to do with the ports, Dennis. And to do with the leadership within the department, and I just noticed a response from the minister yesterday to my colleague Sinead Ennis on the ports issue, and I just, uh, in the hands already says here, this is not a matter that I'm taking forward. The senior responsible officer is looking after that. Um, I do not wish to see any uh, further points of entry developments at Warren Point Port, uh, the particular that port. I suppose the question I'm asked in terms of the leadership of the department. The minister says he's not taking this forward. It's the SRO. So, Within the department, is, does, is the executive authority relating to this with you then, Dennis, not the minister? Is there no ministerial oversight there? What's the situation? Well, the, the, way, the way it's worked to date um, is that the minister has certainly, um, as, I, as I said in my opening statement, there are two elements to this. Mm -hmm. The minister is opposed to it, and he's made his position clear on that. Um, within the department then, obviously, as we have developed this, We've sought to take a st you know any any um, view we can from the minister about you know how to if if the protocol is implemented from his perspective how to minimise the damage to business and potentially to people having to pay more. So he has given us those views and we have taken those views on board. Um, and ultimately, I suppose it's not that abnormal to have a situation where a senior official takes over as SRO. I mean, if this was simply some facilities that we were building and they had nothing to do with the wider political context, then it wouldn't be that unusual for an SRO to be appointed, for that SRO then to take that programme of work forward and to take on board various views as, as they would go through it. And that would be a normal position. I think what's, what's different in this case is that the, minister, the minister's got to a point where he believes that he hasn't got the clarity from the UK government and from the EU, and that in that situation he feels that it's not, and you know that it would not be the right thing to do to move ahead and complete this. And you know, if if we were looking at this three years ago, I would think that's absolutely the right approach. 
because you know there are very very significant issues which we would not we would like to be able to deal with in, in better time. I mean, I said that the last time we were here. So as of now, um, but the, the challenge then is really around the legality of this, because we now know that we are not going to have everything in place on the 1st of January. Um, but we also know that we need to comply with domestic law, and um, the UK needs to comply with international law in order, we, we just need to, there's no question about that. That's, that's my duty as an official, and it's the duty of officials in the department. So we're proceeding. So we're proceeding with the work on that basis, and I suppose the minister recognises that there is a legal position, and that really there's nothing that can be done about that other than to to comply with the law. Um, so to, to just I just want to just clarify. So the minister then said yesterday as well that, we, that they've given very clear expectations to the senior civil servant in this case who is taking it forward. So are are you are you reporting to George Eustace or Edmund Pitts? Oh, I, I, I'm absolutely clear. I am working to the minister. I am working to the minister. I am under the direction and control of ministers. That's that's a absolutely. Even though he's not, he says he's not taking forward the project. Um, in this particular case, he he doesn't wish to take forward the prog project. Um, but uh, we are complying with the law. So he is he is effectively taking over it and taking over the project uh, forward project, and you're you're accountable to him. Is that that be fair to say, Dennis? I'm accountable to Minister Putz. I'm accountable to the Minister generally, yeah. um, but in this particular case, I'm acting against the Minister's wishes. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and, and, and sorry, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Obviously, um, what you're what you're getting at is you're getting at the fact that we're we're caught in an impossible position. Yeah. And the impossible position we're caught in is that we do work to ministers. I absolutely believe in the de democratic principle of working to ministers. It's not just a something I do as a day job. Absolutely believe in that. However, I'm also absolutely required to comply with the law. Yeah. And what we've found is because we've been put in an impossible situation as a result of the wider politics around this, we find ourselves having to navigate our way through this process. And that's what we're doing. And, and in fairness, it may not look pretty, but we have actually been very open and honest about where we've been. And we've done it in a very clear way. And that's, that's the best... That's the best I can tell you about where we are. Yes. Um, John? Mr Chair, thank you. Uh, you uh, before I go to matters of, of serious concern to me, and, and the officials will know their matters that I've raised before, uh, and committee members will know that as well, I want to just take a, a second or two, Chair, if I may, to, to once again thank the officials who have been doing um, a huge volume of work around these issues uh, in an, uh, an ever-changing landscape, and, and I know the, the task for them has not been an easy one, and I'm fully recognising that, uh, and political processes have sometimes um, overtaken uh, what is expected. Three areas that I want to address, really, the, the internal market bill and all of the uncertainties around that, the, the programme assurance review and also veterinary uh, controls and arrangements going forward. So firstly, on the internal market bill, can I ask, is it not the case that um, this has simply introduced um, another series of really rather grave unknowns. For example, we're talking today about complying with domestic law. The uh, process of the internal market bill means we don't know at this stage what that domestic law will be. So could we be given some indication of the additional workload that internal market bill preparation has introduced for the department here? and whether or not that has impacted on other EU exit preparations. Secondly, on the programme assurance review, which, which unfortunately tells us that the targets have moved from uh, red amber to red absolute. That's a, a matter of absolute concern. Can I ask very pointedly, what impact did any stalling of ministerial decisions around infrastructure or ports impact on that change of grade in preparation for EU exit, and what additional workload has been attributed to that? Because it seems that a DEFRA directive moved things on prior to that, things weren't moving as they might have, and if that contributed to the move from uh, red amber to red, then I think the committee should know. Thirdly, on the uh, veterinary issues, um, that there are currently in place preparations for a common veterinary area. 
that would uh, assist in the control of disease, trade in animals, and the import of animals from, from third countries. Also, uh, it's my assumption that in the absence of a trade deal, that those current preparations would fall. They would therefore have to be extensive and time-consuming checks on, on animals. And could we be given some information around planning processes there also? Okay, I'll, I'll maybe, um, what I'll do is I'll deal with the, the, the red one first, the, the gateway, and then um, I'll maybe bring in some of my colleagues to talk in a bit more detail about the impacts. So in terms of the project, I suppose it's worth saying we're doing a seven-month project, really, um, which should have been done over a period of years. Um, there's really been two sets of interventions, um, you know, by the minister, I suppose, and during the course of that, um, one of which was around reducing the scale of the physical facilities. Again, a perfectly legitimate thing to do, um, and, um, but that would not of itself have created a, a delay because we still had to do the business case alongside that, so we were doing that. Um, more recently, the interventions would have probably added maybe a week or so onto the process, but because we moved very quickly into a situation where the executive was discussing this, and this became this moved into the political sphere, it didn't actually cause um, as much delay. You know, it didn't it, it didn't cause a, a very long delay in itself. Um, any delay is a problem. There's no doubt about it. At where we are. Um, but the other side of that is um, we do make we need to make this work. I mean, there's no point in us in us building the facilities if the actual um, if we're not getting the help that we need from UK and the EU. Um, so there's a number of things, for example, that the minister had absolutely nothing to do with. There's the wider negotiations and the position in terms of the third country. Uh, there's issues around you know the third country status and and how we get that approved. Um, there are issues around the IT, for example, that's, that we're, as we've said, we're having to resolve. Um, so I think it would be unfair to say, for me to say that the interventions of themselves have led to the red. I think the red, to be fair to everybody, I said this on the, on the 4th, of Ju 4th of June, I said it was a red amber, um, but that we would keep it under very close review and frankly, everything would have had to have worked perfectly um, over, over a space of time like that and clearly that just hasn't been the case. So um, I don't think, I, th I think it's important to say, of course, ministerial interventions add time. That's absolutely normal in any process, and that's the way it should be, because frankly, we need that help to make sure that what we're doing is, is, is in the appropriate context. Um, but I, I couldn't um, you know, say that this was all down to the minister. Don't know if that's it. Oh, sorry. And then UK, um, I think maybe to talk about the specific uh, work involved in the um, UK internal market bill. I think Norman might want to add a few words because obviously he'll have been closer to that. Okay, uh, thank, thank you, Dennis, uh, and hopefully, hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes. Um, so, <clears throat> yes, I, mean, uh, I think the, the question was uh, uh, around uh, does this create uh, additional workload or unknowns uh, in, in, in moving forward? Um, I suppose we need to go back to the the purpose of the Internal Market Bill, uh, the UK leaves the regulatory regime of uh, the uh, EU at, at the end of this year, uh, and powers do revert to the UK and to the devolved administrations. So the purpose of the Internal Market uh, Bill uh, is to start to provide clarity on how the actual UK market will function, uh, and it is important that it does function uh, uh, properly, uh, and so it starts to provide that clarity. Uh, very important principles in there around mutual recognition um, of goods and services across the, the regions of the UK uh, and, and non-discrimination. So th these are important issues, uh, and this does provide uh, a welcome clarification uh, in terms of those matters. It also, for Northern Ireland, very importantly, provides uh, additional clarification around unfettered access, it starts to um, uh, provide the uh, the legislative basis uh, that was uh, discussed in, in the command paper earlier this year uh, and makes clear that there should be no new checks or controls on goods moving from Northern Ireland uh, to GB for, for qualifying goods. Um, and uh, also provide some uh, additional information powers around the, uh, the, the reserving the powers to control 
uh, potentially distortive or harmful uh, subsidies uh, and makes clear that it is for UK Parliament to uh, have exclusive ability to legislate for subsidy control. These are all very important matters for the, in, the functioning of the internal market of the UK and so it starts to give that clarity um, that, that uh, we really do need going forward. So it doesn't really, it's not the case of adding to the, the workload, uh, it's really starting to put in place the, uh, the pieces of the jigsaw if you like uh, as, as to how the, uh, the internal market will work uh, and how we all function within that. Okay, and then maybe Robert, if you want to respond on the last question. <clears throat> yes, John. The, as you say, um, the protocol creates the SPS uh, zone of the island of Ireland. Um, the function of that, as you, as you are aware, is to ensure that no checks have to be carried out on the border between Northern Ireland and the South, uh, and to therefore to allow free movement within that single market of animals, plants and foods, and also to protect then, uh, by extension, the European internal market uh, from what is seen as a threat from a third country, which will be GB. So the EU take these controls, the points of entry, into the EU, into the island of Ireland, very seriously. And that's why it's codified to such a detail within the official control regulations uh, and why it is a, an issue of such import. So this was always going to be very difficult. Um, your question is around uh, the range of options available to us now. The review into the uh, pre preparations has said now that it's unachievable. So as well as taking on to uh, deliver our plan A, which is to get on and deliver the facilities, we also now need to develop contingencies the contingencies um, replace brand new facilities, uh, perhaps IT if it's not ready, with paper and people. So if there is uh, no further agreement uh, between the EU and UK on SPS, uh, we will have to, um, throughout the island of Ireland to points of entry, implement full WTO checks as laid out in the legislation. And that, I don't like saying anything's impossible, but that's getting close to it. You know, one container of supermarket product uh, can contain 400 consignments, which would require 400 uh, certs on one container. We're talking about 400 containers of different sorts per day, consignments a day. Um, so you can see the volumes coming into Northern Ireland of product and that would need to be checked. And with uh, only a contingency system to do that, that's going to be at very best very difficult. So we're still hoping that there's going to be, um, and with some reason, um, that there will be uh, some arrangements uh, to minimise the checks required. Using the EU's own principles, uh, which are based around risk, obviously the risk on the 1st of January hasn't changed very much from the 31st of December. So there would be logic in permitting uh, uh, flexibilities within the rules to allow um, a minimisation or a reduction in the checks required on the island of Ireland, not just in Northern Ireland, of material coming from GB and still be able to protect the internal market and the SPS uh, status of the island of Ireland. So my, my, my short summary of my long answer, John, is that where we're at, if there's no agreement, I cannot deliver the checks that will be needed. Um, with minimisation and with a contingency plan and with cooperation on all parties involved, the UK, EU, um, and the work that we're doing ourselves, it's still possible that we will be able to deliver checks sufficient to keep products moving. Uh, can I just come back to you briefly on, on, on that last one? Um, uh, but comment before I do that, that in relation to, to the earlier replies for, for which I thank Dennis, that there is a certain irony to me that, that someone who was reluctant to, uh, in terms of ministerial direction, someone who was reluctant to implement um, the infrastructure required around EU exits, could have, in effect, justified the very uh, another reason for extension to the to the deadline. Because um, if the state of preparedness is, is not good, then um, of course there would be a, a further argument to extend. But on the business of the veterinary issues, can I ask then uh, to Robert and thank him for that detail? Will additional resource be required? in this scenario that was described, um, there's going to have to be, as I understand it, checks um, 
at either the entry to the EU or Northern Ireland in the absence of an agreement, and that would obviously have an impact on businesses, agri-food industry and, and other individuals, and, and of course an impact in relation to animal welfare. The plans we submitted to the Commission for their approval, because everything we do has to be approved by the Commission as far as the facilities and, and um, practices processes are involved. Um, we were talking around 100 people, 100 additional inspectors. Um, if to implement a contingency, it will require more than that. Let's be clear, those, although I'm recruiting both vets and, and technical officers at the moment, initially those staff will all have to come within my own resource. So I will have to rob Peter uh, to pay Paul within my own staff, initially until we get additional staff in. Um, we'll bring in some agency staff, of course, to help that as well. Um, but the, the, the majority of the veterinary staff will come from within my own, my, with my own my, my staff. Uh, so it'll come off the TB programme, it'll come off other programmes. Um, that's inevitable. Um, but hopefully this will be for short term. And uh, as I say, I'm still hopeful that the checks that will have to be carried out, uh, that a way can be found to minimise them. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, William? Thank you, Mr Chairman. And thank you again for your presentation. In relation to unfettered excess, at this stage, uh, have we any definition uh, what the qualifying goods will be and the qualifying businesses will be in relation to unfettered access? There's, there's no, there's no uh, definitive definition of this as yet, as yet, and this is something we're seeking clarity on. Uh, I don't know, Norman, if you've heard anything since, but Norman might want to come in on that. Yes. Yeah, th those uh, discussions are continuing, uh, and obviously uh, it's a very particular issue for the uh, agri-food sector. Uh, they wish to have uh, assurance uh, that, uh, yes, unfettered access absolutely to the GB market, uh, but they also want to protect the reputation uh, of Northern Ireland as a source uh, of, uh, of high quality uh, food of, of good provenance. Uh, and therefore don't want to uh, have Northern Ireland being seen as uh, uh, um, an open back door. So there's a, there's a delicate balance to be struck here. Uh, and this is something that uh, there, there's ongoing discussions uh, with ourselves, the, the food sector in Northern Ireland, uh, and our counterparts in, in Whitehall, and those discussions continue. In, in relation to checks and goods coming into Northern Ireland, and the issue that Robert has mentioned. Is it not a fact that mo the vast majority of those goods are coming into Northern Ireland to remain in Northern Ireland, and only a small percentage of that would be going on to the Irish Republic? I would have thought, using no matter than me, that been the case. Can most of this not be done with paperwork? That, you know, the retailers that are importing or bringing stuff, not importing, but bringing stuff in from the mainland through their own uh, re distribution process, Surely there has to be a system easily put in place to identify that quite quickly, that there's not need for checks on that. No. <clears throat> I'll just take the Members' Committee back a, a little bit again to remind them that there are three levels of checks. There's documentary checks, identity checks and physical checks. Um, everything needs a documentary check, everything needs an identity check. Only a proportion of goods usually need uh, a, a physical check. <clears throat> Live animals need 100%. Uh, what what William has, has brought up is this the issue of retail group goods, um, to which if you apply a risk, a risk assessment, there is very little risk particularly to the internal market, particularly if those mar goods are going to a supermarket within Northern Ireland. Uh, and those will be the arguments that are being put to the Commission on flexibilities uh, as, to, as to, you know, they may need certification, uh, they may, may need a very uh, rudimentary identity check but to allow those goods into Northern Ireland without any physical checks at all. And you know, from a professional veterinary point of view, I can so see no reason why that shouldn't be allowed. But that's subject to negotiations. And uh, until it happens, I can't assume it's going to happen. But it will cause real difficulties. But half the consignments coming in are supermarket lorries. And without that flexibility, it's going to be very difficult because that will swamp us with everything else. It seems very logical and makes common sense. And anything else would be crazy, you would have thought. Um, I'd like you to go and tell the Commission that. <laughs> <laughs> common sense doesn't always uh, act in negotiations. Okay. Okay, William. Um, uh, just before I move on around, just uh, 
just looking through some, some notes here. See it in relation to the um, the bill. This this bill proposes to disapply uh, to disapply the state aid state, state aid rules. Okay, but <coughs> immediately post transition, the WTO rules will come in, which sets no limits on the blue box and the green box um, levels of subsidies. Will that, will that not have the potential of creating a huge distortion between here and Britain? And leave a very, very on, uh, even playing field between the farmers in North of Ireland and the farmers in Britain. Well, I, I think I'm going to call on Norman again on that one. Um, I think the, the only point I would make, obviously, is that they're, they're taking these powers, but whether they would intend to use them or not is a different matter. And obviously, there's negotiations going on. But, Norman, do you want to say something about the potential impacts of a scenario such as the one that Declan's talked about? Yes, uh, so the UK has not yet set its internal uh, state aid or, or subsidy regime, uh, and so that uh, that remains an, an unknown uh, at this stage. Under the protocol, uh, Northern Ireland will be subject to uh, EU state aid uh, uh, rules, uh, and within that, uh, there is a, a carve out uh, of, of state aid specifically for agriculture uh, in, uh, in terms of the overall uh, overall limit on the, the level of support that can be provided uh, outside of normal state aid controls for agriculture, um, and also a proportion of that that must be green box compliant uh, within uh, WTO uh, parlance, uh, and and. That's what we're, we're, we're working towards. Uh, so yes, it, it is a concern, uh, I suppose, from a, a, a Northern Ireland perspective, uh, that we don't yet know what the the, uh, the regime will be uh, in, in GB. Um, and yes, there is that potential uh, that uh, there could be uh, a, an on-level playing field when it comes to agri-food if uh, there was to be a, a more generous uh, state aid regime operating uh, or subsidy regime operating within GB compared uh, with Northern Ireland. And that is something obviously that uh, would be of concern to us. Uh, at this stage, we have no line of sight uh, on what that might be. Um, we have, of course, uh, in another uh, arena, um, an understanding that the level of support going to agriculture uh, will be maintained at current levels. Uh, that was a manifesto commitment. Uh, and therefore, I suppose that gives us some sort of line of sight as to what the, the overall level of support might be um, across the, the UK. But of course, we don't know how other other regions might, uh, the form of that support might take. Um, and that obviously could be a concern if it were to be a, a distortive form uh, of support. Uh, but again, the internal market bill does talk about uh, the UK Parliament having the exclusive ability to legislate for regulation of uh, distortive or harmful subsidies. So there's a, quite a complex um, framework uh, existing in here, and uh, and we don't yet have a complete line of sight as to how all of that will, will shake out uh, over, over the coming months. Well, Norman, would that be connected to Clause 48 of the bill, which proposes to unilaterally amend the, the NI Act, which is the legislative basis of this place that we were in here, um, on the regulation of the impact of what they deem harmful and distortive subsidies. You know, is, is that connected to the the, 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 the the future regime in Britain? And, you know, is the, the, the terminology harmful and distortive subsidies, is that like loaded language to, to make it look out as if they're doing us a favour, actually depriving us of, the, the, you know, having uh, what, what deciding what harmful and, and uh, distortive subsidies might be? Yeah, I think you have to look at it through two lenses. Uh, you know, and you, you can look at it in terms of what state aid uh, and, and such controls and subsidy controls uh, might prevent you from doing, but you also have to look at it, at it in the context of the protections it provides. This this uh, extends all across the UK. Uh, so we could be uh, um, suffering from... Um, the effects of distortive or harmful subsidies that might be introduced in other parts of the UK. So this also provides us with protections, uh, and that's an important point to remember as well. Um, and certainly uh, under the Internal Market Bill, I mean, we can ask, for example, the Office of Internal uh, for Internal Market to, to, to look at um, regimes that are inter introduced elsewhere if we believe that they are creating harmful uh, or distortive effects. Uh, so. It's a much as much about protection as it is about preventing us um, doing things that we might otherwise want to do. Uh, so there are checks and balances in here. The only thing I would add to that, just to 
say is um, just, um, and, and it kind of relates to some of the briefing and so on that we've been asked for. The committee's asked us for a briefing on this and we've given briefing. And the briefing is based on the sort of um, operational or technical issues that Norman's outlining, outlining and talking about that. There are bigger political issues in all of this. And just to be clear, our uh, advice, as you'd expect as officials, is simply around the, the technical side of it. So I don't want our um, position on that to be in any way misinterpreted as a political view one way or the other about the rights and wrongs of those bigger issues. So just I think it's important that we just draw that line. Because as, as good officials, uh, people like Norman and Rosemary will quite correctly answer a technical question in technical terms. <laughs> Okay, so that's just to, just to clarify that point because you were asking that question of me anyway. So I just want to make that clear. Thanks. I'm going to move around the, the Philip. Thank you, Chair. I mean, notwithstanding the hard work, Dennis, of, of you and your team and, and and the department, that was a very bleak and stark uh, and, and probably depressing assessment of, of where we're at. I mean, I'm, I mean that's just from a committee member's point of view. I mean, if I was a business. Uh, out there listening to that, you know, I, I would uh, think that was a very scary assessment, uh, so close to the 1st of January. And, 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 and your, your uh, briefing has opened up a pile of questions. Uh, I mean, because we actually sat here uh, a number of weeks ago and got, uh, had a briefing from the UFU and a number of businesses. You know, and at that point they were saying, I'm, I'm probably way off the mark, but my memory. I think it was maybe 67 or 69 questions, and only one or two of them had been answered, give or take. Uh, and it doesn't seem that we're any further forward. In fact, it probably seems now that there are maybe more uh, questions that need answered in relation to this. And I just want to I mean, delve a wee bit further on some of the points that John and the Chair had made in relation to the Minister, because in answering John's question, you said that you know it would be normal practice that ministers would ask questions and interfere in the process. Uh, this doesn't seem normal, just f from my looking at it, uh, and the minister's approach probably doesn't seem normal. I mean, because we've had a number of debates in the, in the Assembly about the Internal Market Bill, where, where the British government are determined to break international law. It seems, uh, from my interpretation of what happens, we actually have a minister overseeing the department who is determined uh, not to implement the law, uh, and maybe maybe I'm more than that properly, but he, he doesn't seem to be uh, fully enthusiastic about implementing the law, and that has having an impact on the work of the department. But it's, I mean, it's having a bigger impact on businesses and the community in terms of preparation for Brexit. No, I, I mean, I think that's an, a totally unsatisfactory situation. Uh, Given the you know, Brexit, I know we're in the midst of a pandemic, but Brexit may well be the, the issue of this generation and, and the issue of this assembly. And, and we have a minister that seems to be interfering uh, uh, or not allowing the department that he's supposed to oversee the ability to do the work. So, I mean, I, I'm just making that point. I, I think that from where I'm sitting it is very, very, very serious. Uh, and is going to have a serious negative impact on our business community out there. In terms of just some of the, the outworkings of, of what you've said in your briefing, the impact, so I mean, not, not everything's going to be in place, there were lacking clarity, the delivery programme is red, and I mean, we've talked through an awful lot of technical jargon today. In simple terms, what does, you know, if, if we don't have this situation sitting ready, as we, we aren't going to, what, what is the impact going to be for businesses out there? No, what, you know, what is this going to have in terms of our economy? Uh, you know, how should they be looking at this briefing that we're getting today? Okay. Um, I suppose um, I, I'll bring in Robert um, at the end of that. I think there's probably a couple of points which are worth uh, touching on. Um, I think it is fair to say that this is a very unusual situation. And um, I think it's also fair to say that you know, there has been some very mixed signals coming out um, from the beginning about this, um, around, particularly around unfettered access. Uh, again, that's the nature of political debate. Things come out and, and so on. But that has definitely set the context for this. And it is notable that really until the 20th of May command paper came out from the UKG, that was the first 
really, in my view, solid enough. Well, and in the view of the executive, it was the first solid uh, setting out of the UK's position, which then led to me being appointed as the SRO for the for the project. So I do think we have to take that into account. I think the other thing is that you know the ministers. He, he has been open about it. He's advised us as officials that he's always been strongly opposed to additional checks and requirements on goods moving in the UK internal market. But he has acknowledged the commitments in the protocol and the need to ensure that goods legally enter Northern Ireland on the 1st of January. So he has done that. I just have to put that on the record, to be fair. Um, on the issue of the Stark assessment, I agree with you. And one of the things that we've tried to do in this process is to, to apply the sort of project management practice and to be very open about things because there's just no point. Whatever issues there are, we have to get them out there. So um, we won't. The Stark bit is the bit about that we will not have everything ready by the 1st of January. We have got a procurement underway. That procurement is working at a pace, and I think it's probably worth saying, I think it's, I haven't measured it, but I suspect that we've got a business case which has been agreed for a, 43, a 45 million pound option through both our Department of Finance and HM Treasury from, start, from the start of that project to the 10th of August. That's pretty much a record. I mean, that's fantastic to get to that point. So, Everybody is working together, and I have to give credit to colleagues in DEFRA and in colleagues in, in Treasury and so on that are working on this. However, we'll have so we'll have the procurement well underway. We'll have the physical checks that Roberts talked about. We'll have uh, buildings will be there to enable those to happen. Um, we uh, we will have a form of IT there, and we will have people there. Again, as Robert said, we'll have to pay borrow from Peter um, to pay Paul. The issue then, I suppose, is what our contingency arrangements look like, and uh, Robert can talk a bit about, about that, but the bit I want to reassure people on is it's not we're just saying, look, this has gone wrong, we're giving up. The reason people go for a red in a project is so that they can be, it's the reason that gateway teams will assess a project as red is not just to say stop, give up, it's actually to say stop, what you're doing will not deliver the way you want it to. Now you need to realign. So I just think it's important that we don't get too, uh, too despondent in the sense that, and, and I think the thing that gives me confidence as SRO is the team and what they have done in an unbelievably short period of time. And again, that's not been, that's not been anybody's fault. But the very practical consequences, if, if, if we didn't have these measures in place, frankly, it would add friction and it would add cost. That's, those are two things that it would add. And that would have an impact on businesses. It would also have an impact on consumers. And the challenge with this is, even if we were working on the basis that we thought we'd get everything in place by the 1st of January, without that clarity, we would still be in trouble in terms of those two things, because we would not have the... We need help here in order to get this to happen, because, for example, people use the term border control posts. We use the term points of entry. And, and it's, it's not just because there's political debate about that or anything like that. It's to reflect the fact that this is a port, these, these are ports within um, a state. And that has very practical implications, because you just cannot have a situation where, a, for example, a retail lorry has 400 certificates, and you're having to start you know, issuing certificates for each one of those products. Um, so, Robert, I don't know if you want to add anything around the consequences. I, um, I, I bet, perhaps. Um, but very simply, your question to me is how well prepared are you? And my glib answer to that could be for what? Because it's that uncertainty that Dennis has talked about clarity. It's uncertainty that is causing a, a huge amount of difficulty. Um, now, we hope that there's clarity the EU have talked about the middle of October being the end of negotiations, and by then we should at least know what that, what it is we're preparing for, and that unfortunately is not that far away. It's a, it's close. So on, on contingencies, um, we continue, I must emphasise, to work on Plan A to get the facilities in place as quickly as we can. So that's that's the first plan. Then Plan B uh, is about the contingencies. So we're out there looking for buildings to repurpose. We're looking for additional land to put up um, temporary buildings in which checks could be carried out. And we will continue doing the training uh, in any case 
And just as an aside, some of that training the EU has, uh, has offered to assist us with through a better training for safer food project uh, to lay on the training and to, uh, and to pay for it. Um, so you know, there, it's not that we're not talking to each other uh, about, about what can be done. On the ICT thing, um, just yesterday, um, informal contact between officials uh, has resulted in the EU officials, our, our technical people, talking to our technical people about how we can use this Traces NT with our own IT to build a slick system. Until we see the problems again, we don't know the size of that, that problem, but that, that could really help to move the systems through. Um, the IT system has to talk to HMRC system, has to talk to our own system, has to talk to the EU system. But that, that, I'd be optimistic that that could be doable. So we're, we're out on all the points of entry. Uh, we're looking for facilities. We're looking about how they could repurpose them. We're tra getting on with training the staff in any case because we will need them no matter what on the 1st of January. And you know, so th there is a, a capability there to carry out a level of checks. Uh, the, the pessimistic piece is that uh, what I'm saying this morning is that for, for some, um, the volume of checks makes this virtually impossible to do according to uh, third country trade um, criteria. So the, the flexibilities are absolutely paramount for us and uh, for us to deliver a system that will fit business in Northern Ireland. So if I was a business in Northern Ireland, um, I'd be keeping a watching brief at the moment until we find out um, at the end of negotiations what it is we're, we're dealing with and then it would be a more sensible time to start making their own contingencies and their own preparations as to how they want to uh, continue to, to trade into Northern Ireland and to bring goods into Northern Ireland uh, because they may have to change the processes. That container with 400 different goods delivering straight from pickup centre in Leicester into a supermarket in Northern Ireland with a range of goods they may have to think about how can we put the same sort of goods in one container so that there's less chance of it having to be checked. So there, there, there'd, be, um, there'd be a need for um, the, the haulage industry and for industry to change. There may be a need for them to change their operating procedures to fit in uh, with an efficient checks system. But until we know the nature of the checks system, um, it's very hard for me to advise industry on that other than um, you know, keep a watching brief and we will talk to you when we have uh, clarity as to, as to what we, how we should take this forward. Um, Dennis mentioned in his brief the importance of communication. And we're at that stage now, or getting close to that stage, where communications uh, with industry are absolutely paramount because we can get, on, we know we can get through this together. Um, it's, almost, it's, it's almost too late to stand on hilltops shouting at each other. We have to get on with fixing this. Just a wee brief uh, question. Who decides uh, what's a qualifying good for the North in terms of uh, here trade between here and TV? Well, this will be this will be a matter for the Joint Committee. So. I, I'm just wondering. Sorry, maybe I don't want to hold you up, but I was going to say if you, if if at some point I'd like to bring Mark in to talk a little bit about the project, I but that's okay. Qualifying goods was mentioned in the context of the finance bill or something. Um, do you have anything on that, Norman, uh, in terms of the qualifying goods in the finance bill? Uh, yes. Um, so, uh, no, uh, qualifying, qualifying goods, um, it's, a, it's a unilateral issue uh, for uh, UK government, uh, so it's not something that's uh, going to be uh, coming from the, the Joint Committee. Um, and so, yes, there, there will be uh, a, a piece of support legislation at some point, uh, which will define a qualifying good. Uh, I think uh, maybe, Chair, you, you, you were thinking about the finance bill in the context of uh, goods at, defining goods at risk, which is goods uh, coming the other way uh, from GB to Northern Ireland. Uh, so qualifying goods is relation from Northern Ireland to GB under unfettered access arrangements uh, and unfettered access is a, is a unilateral uh, UK issue. Um, just before I move around the on, on the topic of qualifying good, we know that even, even the, the internal market bill uh, doesn't prohibit the, the checks for what goods qualify and what goods don't qualify. So. And just on the ports issue again, so you said previously there that you know, when, whenever you are mapping out and planning the, the shape of your ports, you said that you weren't planning 
parking parking areas. So how, how can you make a robust plan for ports if we don't know what will be required for the checks for what is and what isn't a qualifying good? And also, and this is something I'm just wondering, has the department been in conversations with DEFRA or the JC on this here? Because a lot of the, the products, the agri-food products that we have in here in the north, don't emanate solely from the north. And I made the point yesterday that up until August this year, we imported 41,000 cattle from the south and 350,000 pigs are imported every single year from the south. So well, pork, the pork products or the beef products that emanates from those, from the all or parts of those imports, you know, will they be, will, will they be considered as qualifying goods because they didn't emanate in the north of Ireland. I think that's the sort of, uh, you know, I'm presuming that that's the conversations that Deere will be having with uh, DEFRA and others about the, 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 the unique um, island-wide um, production lines that we have here on this, in, uh, you know, in, in, in Ireland. So, and, and um, apologies because I was, I was thinking about uh, NI to GB movements when I answered, so thank you to Norman for correcting me on that. The point is about at the point about the um, just to, we'll do, we'll touch on the issue about documentary and ID checks first. The reason for the um, what I call parking areas, we call them triage areas, really would be to do documentary and ID checks on the products coming in, and then a certain percentage of those would be selected for physical checks. Um, one of the things we would be looking to do would be to see, obviously, if there are ways of reducing the number of checks on, say, retail. Um, but other um, options would be about where you do those checks. So, for example, would it be possible to do checks across on the other side of the Irish Sea? And those are the kinds of things that need to be resolved, because clearly if you were doing those, as, as products were coming over, if you could protect, uh, check, do the documentary and ID checks before they got on the boat, seal them, move them across, then in that particular case, um, you wouldn't actually need the triage areas. If, however, that's not agreed, or there isn't uh, a way of getting that to, to, be, to happen and be approved, then we're uh, back into needing triage areas, and we'd have to look at that option again. So we've left it open, if needs be. But Robert, do you want to add anything? Just an, uh, and in fact, what you're talking about is some paint on the ground and toll booths with the right ICT in them. So, you know, it's not, that's not a big build. It's to find the right area, of course, is always the issue, and we have identified areas where they could be put if we have to do them. But, um, you know, building them now, when you have no idea about the number of booths, the area you'd need, the amount of parking space, would, you know, might end up in nuggetry work. On, you know, the, the question about how do you decide on, this, on the size, um, it's a, what you're doing is trying not to build too big to have a white elephant not to build too small so that people will have to wait unnecessary times to have a plan that will allow segregation of different goods because obviously you can't have fish in the same area as, as plants uh, because of contamination. Um, so you have to have different different bays, different areas for different quality, different quantities of goods. So you know, we, we have proposed plans which I'm very content with that I think are fit for purpose under the majority of likely scenarios, but that could be extended. It's a big, long building, and you can extend if you had to. But as a, as a day one facility, I'm very content that uh, what we're building would be fit for purpose, neither too big nor too small. You'll probably come back and shout at me about that later. And, and, and do, <laughs> do, do, just on your other point, I suppose, about the integrated, wouldn't have any uh, disagreement. There are hugely integrated supply chains, north and south, and it's really important that those, those are um, maintained and enhanced. Likewise, there are really integrated supply lines east and west, and actually that's on the island of Ireland generally. So we, what we're trying to do is to work our way through a conundrum here that has been, you know, it's, it's, it's the situation we're in, and we just, we're trying to find ways to make sure that, those, that, that we're not blocking, we're not introducing unexpected consequences um, by, uh, you know, taking one action to try and ease one direction and then finding that that's going to create problems in another. So we're trying to just create as little friction north, south, east, west as we possibly can. Apatze, Amen, Patsy Malone. Yeah, chair. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, and um, thanks very much for for the officials. And um, uh, in many ways, and Dennis and Robert will know this. This sounds very much like Groundhog Day over the stuff that 
we've met up in Bally Kelly on repeatedly over this past couple of years. Um, we're so anyway. Um, I'll move through the issues, and <clears throat> some of them have been touched upon and expanded upon there. Um, but um, initially, um, first of all, I'd like to ask Dennis there what legal advice has been sought around um, the potential for conflict, because I, I did say that you're you, you're very clear and you repeated it a couple of times that uh, your function is to comply with the law. Now, the query is, obviously, is that compliance with the law a la Westminster through the withdrawal bill or the law a la the international binding agreement? And has any uh, legal opinion been sought around that by the department? I'd be very surprised if it hasn't, uh, either from uh, the DSO or the Attorney General. Um, the, the second issue, and I'm trying to work my way through this because it's an unenviable task that you have and, and many others have, is the, the implications of what we're working through at the moment, right? And Robert has always been very good on the practicalities there, um, but I'm looking at a situation where potentially we're going to have a clash on either international law or we're going to have no agreement, right? At the moment, you, you don't have planning permission for the facilities that you need. Um, the buildings, you don't have enough buildings, uh, the, the parking space seems to be the least of your issues and you don't have enough staff uh, to deal with that and ICT has still been worked through. So I'm, I'm interested to hear what the contingencies are in either of both scenarios, A, an agreement and putting all that infrastructure in place and the time frame for that and B, no agreement and the implications there. And then following on from that, uh, what Philip was touching upon there, that uh, yes, we, we certainly want to make sure that there's there's no uh, blocks or stumbling for any business uh, as it moves from uh, the island of Ireland into GB. But similarly, we want to make sure that there's no stumbling blocks uh, within the island of Ireland, which has become, to all due intents and purposes, for major aspects of the agri-food and other sectors, just the one economic unit. So um, do you see any pitfalls there? And uh, I would also like an expansion on the contingencies that, that are in place for either of those scenarios. And then a final thing, Norman, you've probably been watching, I heard you refer to the state aid situation there, where uh, implications of what GB might do and what we're doing here could, could, have, uh, uh, could be negative for us. You probably have watched the, the uh, the trade deal evolving with Japan, where it seems that, that Britain has moved to a position of being in a, a more stringent uh, situation as regards state aid than it would have been as part of the EU in its trade deal with Japan. Now, the implications and consequentials of that for leaving it in a very weak trade uh, negotiating position with the EU bloc on state aid is another thing. Uh, so we may well wind up in a beneficial position as a consequence of that. So I would be interested in hearing those aspects. I've covered quite a bit there, uh, but I wanted to get it all in rather than just staging one question after another and delaying proceedings. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, through, through the Chair, uh, thank you for those questions. I suppose in the legal advice, it's just worth saying that there's both a domestic law issue. I mean, I'll just, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll maybe just read a little bit of this out. I'm always wary, wary when I'm reading from uh, legal texts and I make sure I get it right. Um, so the official control regulations, I think I'd said in my opening statement, but I'll, I'll just say it again. The official controls regulations requirements are part of domestic law as a result of Article 5.4 of the Northern Ireland Protocol and 7A of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. Now, the, the key point about that is that um, there, there are international obligations that apply to the UK, but in addition to that, in terms of this specific case, there are domestic legal obligations. So we, and that, that's where it really hits um, us very directly as a department. It's not just that um, the UK needs to do this as a whole, but we, to, to, com to comply with our law that, we're, we need to, that applies directly to us, we need to do that. So under the OCR, we've talked about the fact that it's responsible, that's, uh, uh, that we're responsible for sanitary and phytosanitary checks. And a decision not to take actions required to implement a legal obligation would be an unlawful decision. And um, if, a, if a minister were to make that decision, and the minister hasn't, hasn't given us a direction or asked us to make that decision, or hasn't made that decision, but just were a minister, hypothetically, uh, to make a decision, um, it would be in breach of commitments made under the ministerial code to uphold and support the rule of law. 
An unlawful act is uh, void and of no effect if it's on, obvious to an onlooker that's an un unlawful. And obviously, in this case, it's clear that we're, you know, that we're already in an impossible position in terms of the timetable. So um, basically, that clarifies the position very, you know, that that, that makes the position very clear. Um, I suppose the other thing is um, the consequences of an unlawful decision by the department would be a ju judicial review or a claim for damages by affected parties. And furthermore, I suppose failure to implement the Northern Ireland Protocol might result in penalties under the withdrawal agreement to which the UK government might require the department to contribute. So those are the sorts of consequences. I mean, just for your information, then I suppose to, to maybe draw out a little bit my own role, um, permanent secretaries are obliged to act lawfully at all times, apart from the general responsibility on public authorities to obey the law and observe the rule of law and the doctrine of ultra vires that, re uh, that renders certain acts invalid. Um, this obligation arises from a number of sources, so we're talking about as the most senior officer leading and deciding how a department must act. Under the NICS Code of Ethics, a uh, civil servant is expected to carry out his or her, her role with a commitment to stated civil service core values. And finally, the managing public money Northern Ireland requires at paragraph 3.1.1 that an accounting officer take personal responsibility for ensuring that the organisation that he or she manages delivers uh, standards in, in box 1.1. So uh, if, you were, uh, if it was stark earlier, <laughs> you can imagine how that, uh, that, that, that experience from my point of view it makes it very, very clear where I stand. Um, in terms of... On that, Dennis, yes. um, that, that compliance relates to bending international law as well. It, it's, it's international law, and at an, interna at an international level, um, the UK as a whole is required to comply with international law, but in this case, the international requirements are built into, into um, UK domestic law and therefore, that's where it really bites in terms of us. I'm not saying there isn't an international law dimension, but what I'm saying is that translates into domestic law, and that then um, impacts directly on DERA and how we fulfil our responsibilities. Does that make sense? Well, well, have you sought particular legal advice? Yes. Um, you, either you as a permanent secretary or the department, either from the Attorney General or the DSO specifically around this issue where there is potential for conflict between the withdrawal bill and the uh, withdrawal agreement that has already been signed as a binding agreement between uh, the UK government and the EU. So I, I was simply talking about our current legal position. So I wasn't talking about, so I think we're, maybe where you're moving, um, if you don't mind me, it, it sounds like you're moving more towards the impact of the internal market bill, is that right? Sorry, just so I understand. I wouldn't do it. That's where, that's where I started. Sorry, uh, apologies, apologies. The... Okay, sorry. Okay, well, I, sorry, I was, I was, I was no, describing no, the current. I appreciate what you've told me in between times, which is uh, pretty clear in terms of your compliance and the department's compliance with law. Um, but uh, the question that I had asked was, uh, had legal advice been sought by either you as head of the department, as the, uh, the accounting officer for the department, either from the DSO or if the department had sought advice, or indeed through the executive had sought advice from the attorney general on on these matters uh, and the potential for conflict, that, that may exist. yeah. Uh, if you, you can appreciate the, the already, the Lord Chief Justice has flagged this up. So I'd be surprised if someone at the department hadn't. Well, um, I, I'll I'll defer to Norman as to whether there's any legal advice has been sought. Um, I haven't sought legal advice on this, and the reason I haven't sought legal advice on this to date is because this is a Westminster bill. Uh, we don't know what the position is going to be at the end of that. It's about to enter into the uh, committee scrutiny phase. Uh, we will need to understand what the implications for us are at that, but we are not responsible for the bill, promoting the bill, um, or in any way, um, we will simply be the recipients of what comes out of that process. Um, now, again, I'm happy, as you know, for Norman to correct me if I've got any of that incorrect. And if there's other additional advice that we've sought, Norman, you might want to just clarify that point. No, no doubt. I mean, as far as I'm aware, there's no additional uh, legal advice been sought uh, on that particular matter. Okay. Well, I find that quite unusual and shocking. Um, 
that that hasn't been done. And uh, are you aware if any has been sought at um, the executive level? I, I'm not aware of anything being sought at the executive level, but I can certainly make inquiries as to that. Yes, if you would please, because this is this is pretty crucial uh, where where we're leading to. So. Um, Okay, then we, we can move on to the other issues, please, just. Okay, so then, really, do you want to talk a bit more about contingency? Maybe or? that's a chance for Mark. As a Mark, manager. actually, Mark, do you want to say a bit about the contingencies? I think that'd be helpful. Yeah, good point. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, Mark. Okay, thank you. We're currently planning for, I suppose, three different scenarios. Um, so contingency planning for what needs to be in place by the 31st of December. Um, the negotiated minimisation, which is Plan A, which Robert refers to, uh, and I suppose the failure for no agreement uh, to be put in place. And there's three real, three key aspects that we're planning for. So the process, the IT, uh, which are closely linked, uh, and they're slightly different for all scenarios. The infrastructure, which is, uh, which are again slightly different for all scenarios, and and the key key part is, is the staff again slightly different for all scenarios but I would, I would introduce another um, fourth key point which is communication and we're very keen to, keen to get uh, communication at first stage analysis going in particular to this program uh, very very quickly but as you can imagine uh, the picture is is quite it lacks clarity uh, and, and is developing clarity as, as we speak so we're very keen to get out there at the minute so in terms of contingency uh, arrangements for the 31st of December, we're sorting uh, IT and process as we speak. Um, the problems around the IT process that Dennis alluded to uh, was the fact that IPASS, which was a national system, um, was, re was rejected by the EU. Uh, and also the EU Commission didn't consider that the data separation between GB and NI EU was satisfactory. So we're now pushed into a position where DIRA are taking control of linking into the EU's national system uh, called Traces NT. But there's a real positive to that um, because we now have control of our own destiny in Northern Ireland and we have a great dedicated IT team uh, under Paul McGurnan that is working at, at working at pace to develop uh, key aspects of that. For example, we're looking at seeking to automate documentary checks, which will make that process flow quite quickly. And we believe we will have that in place by December. There are other bits and pieces that we're working at uh, closely with uh, HMRC at the minute, which is making sure we can align our systems for checking and the automated systems that we're developing uh, with the HMRC systems, which again is, is a point of contention because that is also in development. So if you can imagine, I'm developing two scenarios for the IT systems at the minute. One is a, is a manual system, um, which Robert alluded to earlier on, which is paper-based and paper, people-intensive. Um, which will be problematic and will cause friction with trade. So that's IT in process. On the infrastructure side, uh, we have clear plans in place for both the negotiated minimisation and uh, the new agreement phase. Uh, and if you're content, uh, Chair, I can provide a written update on that in, in detail uh, as we as we go through. But it's it's detailed, um, and the details and the complexity have been decided and discussed with Robert's teams, we're very clear on exactly what we need. It's just a complex building program. As you can imagine, that's a complex, the complexities are, it's it's about 35 million pounds. It needs to be developed in months. So as the secretary's already alluded to, that's not gonna be done by Christmas. Um, it's likely to be months after Christmas. So we're not talking years, we're talking months. We're still working at pace. And again, I will have fuller details when we go to tender um, later this week. So the tenders are already out and that tender will finalise this week with contractors uh, appointed the week after. So that's how quickly we're working on this project. And again, I can provide you full details on that. But it will, the dates, the final construction dates will only become clear when those contractors have had their hands on the detailed plans that we wish to deliver. And again, we're working at pace to pull those together. And again, I'll update you as we go through. And I suppose in terms of contingency planning, uh, we are developing plans with each of the ports. So we're working at pace over the past two weeks, uh, specifically with Warren Point, Belfast and Larn, um, because the complexities are, are at all those, all those three ports. And we've identified specific buildings that we can use for enhanced physical checks in terms of delivery. But it, it isn't all doom and gloom. We can be very optimistic. We're already doing a lot of status quo checks, as we call them. We're already checking live animals as they come into Northern Ireland through Larne, although it's not designated a point of entry uh, facility. 
Uh, there's lots of good work being, being undertaken by the vets there, so we can sustain the business. Um, if we can just give you a simple example for contingency sputum in place at Belfast, um, there are no point of entry designations for day-old chicks, for example. Um, so we're developing contingency plans to ensure day-old chicks can quickly move through the ports with the relevant SPS and veterinary checks um, to ensure that we don't impact on trade and keep that trade going. So it's a very difficult and complex picture. But I'm being optimistic that we'll have a good set of contingency plans in place uh, before the 31st of December. And it's key that when we get these plans in place, we, of course, communicate them to our retailers and our trading, trading bodies. And we're going to start that work uh, shortly. OK. Um, okay. Pat Mark, and just when you're on that very topic there, see, in relation to Warren Point, um, I know there was an issue raised just recent, just yesterday, I think, at the topic of question time, in relation to the potential expansion of Warren Point for these SPS checks, um, and the fact that there's an ASSA in the vicinity of the port. The issue was raised by my colleague Sinead Ennis yesterday. Are you across the detail of that? Uh, yes, Declan. So we, we've covered out, we've carried out an assessment um, that the facilities at Warren Point allow us to do permitted development. And of course, you, you know my background. I'm from the Environment Agency, um, so I, I'm fully aware of the of the need to carry out um, habitats regulations assessments and the screening and all that good stuff. So we are working very sensitively um, with their certificate of lawful use or development applications to ensure that we we don't have an impact on the SSI or any of the environmental issues down there. And I'm very aware, and indeed, and we've discussed this with David Holmes, the Chief Executive of the Port, that any buildings that we put in place will have to be extremely sensitive. You know, for example, we're going to ensure proper tree planting, we're going to ensure a, a grass roof on, on the building, etc., etc. And again, we've also talked with David Holmes about getting the details of those plans out to the local communities so that they can see them um, at an early stage and are fully aware of what we're trying to do. But of course, I can't do that until I've had a detailed consideration of the site uh, and, the, and, and take forward the design and build. And just to give you an example, we have spent the last week um, doing the necessary initial groundworks uh, and environmental assessments at the Warren Point site, um, so as we can have a desktop analysis followed up by a detailed groundwork assessment, uh, and that report will come to me shortly. Uh, that will indicate if there are any issues or not. And, uh, and of course, I'm, I'm more than happy to share that with you, Declan, as we progress. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Um... Uh, Chair, just sorry, Pat, sorry, 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 no, no, you're grand, you're elaborating on the point there, but just in case we missed it, the any potential for for difficulties on the all island basis, and uh, maybe the, there was one other issue if you could uh, bear with me that the question was raised earlier there and was discussed about the movement of goods and the likes, and it's mainly about retail goods, but specifically, I've raised this previously with Robert, you recall the conversation. And that is uh, pharma goods and uh, medications and veterinary produce, uh, some of which is, is uh, produced at, at different places. The input to it can be maybe three, four different countries, uh, both on the European mainland and domestically. Uh, so if, if you could bear with me on those, just about the, the implications for those two and the north south, uh, the all island economy. If you start with that one, Robert, if you're. On the, on the all island economy part of uh, the SPS checks. The whole point of um, the SPS regime at the points of entry is to allow uh, free freedom of movement. And uh, so I'm not making any plans uh, for, for any additional controls on the island of Ireland. That's taken um, care of by the, by the protocol. On the, on the veterinary medicines, I have a strand of work under my SPS programme that's specifically looking at uh, the veterinary medicines. To be honest, I haven't come up against any any show-stopping issues yet, Patsy. That's that's concerning me on veterinary medicines, um, but I'll, I'm keeping an eye on it, and I'm I'll ensure that you get an update, uh, even if there is nothing more to tell you. To say there's nothing more to tell you, but okay. at the moment I'm not. I have no grave concerns, and and, and just to elaborate a little bit. There's the two issues. There's, there's veterinarians having continued access to the range of medicines they need with the right authorisations. 
But then there's also the issues for our manufacturers in Northern Ireland and their ability to access markets. So there's the two sides of it. There's both the, the veterinary end of it and then there's the manufacturing side. And I'm keeping my, my eye over both. But it's at the periphery. And I'll just go and make sure for you that there are no issues that have come up recently. Well, yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Thank you. Um, uh, Thank you, Patsy. And next on the list is Robert Frank. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your answers so far. Indeed, there are still many unanswered questions, however. Um, I want to just delve a little bit uh, more into the haulage industry. Obviously, all our goods are transported back and forth with our haulage industry. Has there been much communication and working with them in relation to the movement of goods? Uh, there has. Um, Mark can talk about that. He's been doing quite a bit of work with the haulage industry, and obviously that will heat up now over the coming weeks. Mark, do you want to come in? Uh, good morning, Rosemary. Good morning, yeah, Mark. A very, a very key key part of this. Um, I, I'm, I'm also in charge of food uh, security supply, uh, and there are three critical parts to that. So it's the haulage industry, the ports, and the ferries. Um, and a way back, I suppose, in, in March, if you can remember, was the whole food supply shortage issue and the, and the I suppose the panic buying on the shelves, which you might have seen in the in the um, I suppose the UK press at the weekend. Um, so I have a team that specifically engages with the haulage industry, taking on board their comments and concerns regularly um, since March, and again even as late as yesterday, um, when we when we noted the panic buying on the UK shelves that you know is everything okay? We were testing the market with all the key retailers, Spar, Hendersons and the local uh, hauliers associations to make sure that things were still still okay in terms of Northern Ireland's food security supply. Um, and indeed, we played a key role in ensuring that, um, I suppose, DFI and the Department for Transport took forward the intervention package for the ferries earlier on this year, and again, provided support and evidence in terms of the impacts on the haulage industry. So, yes, we're very closely linked, Rosemary, and, and we'll continue to do so, not only through uh, the delivery of the SPS programme, but, but again, in, in, the, in the longer terms, in terms of food security supply. Okay. And the second question I want to ask is the IT systems. You, you spoke quite a lot about the IT systems this morning. Um, how, how much of an agreement has been made in really, or what sort of an agreement is there going forward between your IT systems within Northern Ireland here? your IT systems in DEFRA and the EU IT systems. You know, if one of if one of the three strands pulled out, like EU said, we're not happy with your systems that are in place, you know, how much would that, that set you back or how confident are you that that'll all be ready to go well, on I'll, the first of January? I'll let Mark come in uh, and, and Robert come in with a bit more detail, but I mean, I suppose the key thing is we have access to Traces NT, which is the yeah. EU system. Yeah. Uh, the question is how we get that to join up with the customs um, and yeah. with our own systems. And Robert, do you want to add any detail it's, to that? It's just a matter of our, as I said yesterday, we got approval for this last night for the IT people to talk to each other. And it's all about the, the techie detail around the architecture of each, each party's uh, system about the language they use and about how information moves from one table to another within the ICT structure. Uh, and until the techies talk about that, I, I really don't have a good grasp of the size of the problem. But Mark's confident that, um, and the ICT people more importantly are confident, that this is doable and, and this is achievable by, by the 1st of, uh, by, by, by of, of January. But it's, an un, un, it's another unknown until those conversations have taken place. Um, and, and then we can give more confidence that this can be done. Mark, do you want to add? Hi, Rosemary. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, until, we, until, uh, until, I suppose, a couple of weeks ago, we were fairly committed to the delivery of our IT system using a system called IPATHS. But in effect, IPATHS, the UK system, was really a copy of the Traces NT system, which is itself uh, a new system, um, so NT is just a, another fancy word for saying new technology, which is actually, it's quite old technology to be fair. Um, so there's there's a couple of systems that we need to keep abreast of. We need to keep abreast of the HMRC, the custom system, because it, it, it allows the, the goods to come into Northern Ireland, and that will link 
uh, directly to our uh, own IT system, which will then link into Traces NT. And it's a complex picture of pooling data from those systems, making sure that we have what we need and then putting it back into Traces NT um, when the customs then can release that. So all three have a key part to that. Um, and we're, we are convinced in ourselves that we can deliver our automated systems to allow a lot of these things to happen. But typically the, the discussions we're having uh, relate to automated documentary checks. Because in the old days, um, what would happen is that lorry that's carrying the 400 uh, consignments would need 400 bits of paper. We're trying to automate those uh, bits of paper to go into the system to make things easier for the traders and the vets and the portal staff in Northern Ireland. And we believe we'll have that done by Christmas. Um, we just need to add things such as electronic signatures, because believe it or not, um, Europe only allowed electronic signatures to be used um, in the COVID pandemic. Um, and that's the normal business, the normal way of the world at the minute. So we're trying to get that, that taken forward. And um, we believe that will be shortly after January. Uh, and again, we will have to develop systems to allow the automatic risk profiling. So for example, as a, as a consignment travels over from GB to Northern Ireland, it will be assigned a risk and it will be that risk that will determine whether that vehicle is stopped for a physical check or not. Uh, and we're, we hope that will be in place again shortly after Christmas. So we're, we're, we're remaining positive that we can deliver a, a significant amount of the IT uh, systems required, and we are, con we are content um, that we can access the, Europeas the European systems to allow us to do so. We don't need access to IPATHs anymore um, because we are now selecting uh, the European system as traces NT to allow us to, to move forward with a, a degree of 100% certainty. Thank you. Um, Morris. Morris. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as far as I'm, I'm, I'm aware that uh, the negotiations between the UK government and the EU have not uh, arrived at a situation where the GB, GB is lifted as a third country trader with the European Union. If this doesn't happen, What's the legal position of food entering into Northern Ireland? It's my understanding that uh, there's no agreement between the UK and the EU that food cannot legally enter Northern Ireland. Uh, yeah. What's your response to that, please? Okay, Robert, do you want to? Uh, this is a key part of the negotiations. <laughs> um, one of the, and it's not just a binary because there are different levels of listing. And the easiest one to illustrate is in. Um, the subject of pets, in which I received many, many letters. Uh, will, the, will pets be able to move freely uh, between Northern Ireland and GB uh, next year? Between GB, uh, between Northern Ireland and GB, there should be very little difficulties, because of uh, that's within the gift of the, the British government, of course. But the the level of checks that will be required on pets coming in depends entirely on the level of listing. If they aren't listing it will be as if your dog was coming from America. So it will need a period of quarantine, it will need the whole lot. Um, uh, a movement certificate, a rabies vaccination, a period of quarantine, uh, as if you're coming from a third country, if we're not listed. So that's quite serious. Uh, there's also list two, and then list one. And with list one, the checks would be minimal. Uh, that would be required. Um, so it depends very much on the level of listing as to the level of checks that will be required um, on, uh, on, under the regulations. So it is important, uh, Morris, you've hit a, hit a key one. Um, we, we don't know the level of listing because uh, U UK GB also has to list the European Union. Um, so there's a, there's a, there's a, you know, a, a mirror position here. Uh, there are also discussions on the detail of the certificates that will be used between for goods moving from GB into, into the EU. Uh, which the EU uh, are very keen to, to know more about. But most of this is still stuck within the negotiations, uh, and there's no clarity yet. But you know, in, in the real world, I can't see a position where listing won't happen because of reciprocal actions of them. That's why I've explained that. Um, the EU want to do trade with us. We want to do trade with them. Listing is, is part of that process. And until you're listed, you can't trade. You're quite right. Just as we couldn't send beef to the states until we were listed. 
thank, thanks very much for that. And, and another point, Robert, you had said that you had uh, roughly 100 people, we're well, looking for 100 people to be employed at the, at the ports. You will see the, 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 the current infrastructure changes. Uh, could you outline if all the government bodies and agencies involved uh, in the implementation of this program, would DERA have any, any say or uh, any role in the management of uh, that multi agency ports? Um, the main folks who are concerned are, are, are parts of various parts of DERA. So the plant inspectors are under Fiona McCandless, and uh, John Joe is chief forester. Uh, and um, there's ourselves who do live animals, and then there's the staff of local authorities who do the food checks. Um, and it's that complicated delivery structure um, that we're that we need to coordinate closely and. Uh, that, that's happening, as, as you'd expect, under my SPS programme. So there's a, it is a complicated delivery structure, um, all under the umbrella of HMRC as the, the principal um, authority within, within portal controls. Um, but it's, at the other side of it, it is fairly routine, and it's what happens you know, in, for, and for third country ch uh, checks already in Northern Ireland and across the UK. So the systems are fairly well uh, worked out. It's it's the scale that is the issue here, and um, it, it's you know and and it's where a single physical infrastructure helps us to carry out um, our checks. Uh, sorry, and I've got Border Force uh, there and there, of course, as well, carrying out their checks. But I, I think I think the only thing I would add, just to come back to your question, we don't we don't manage them directly. Obviously, oh, no. they're all different organisations, and we're not we're obviously focusing on the SPS element. Um, you know, there there are issues that we're going to have to are going to have to be resolved outside of this programme around customs and, and all of those other elements. Um, and we're not. We're, no. I've, I've got enough. We've got enough problems at the minute without taking that on as well. Okay. okay. Morris? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yes, sir. Can I just pay tribute to Dennis and uh, uh, Norman and Robert and Mark and the rest of the staff for all the fantastic work that they're doing? It's marvellous. Well done, gentlemen and ladies. Thank you. Morris. Thanks, Morris. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks, Morris. All right. Are you there, Harry? You get me, can you? Yeah, we got you there, Harry. Okay, good job. I couldn't do it myself. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Dallas. Good to see you in with us today. Um, it's in relation to page 26 of point 16 on our pack, sir. Um, it's to do with uh, the bill. Um, EU state aid it ensures rules do not apply in any form in GB, but moving on down, it's the bit that gets me this finance bill not being yet published. I mean, it says it'll give the UK the power to define, to define which goods are not at risk. Really, until that bill is published, we don't know what we're preparing for. I mean, I think minimise is a key word at this stage, isn't it, really? Thank you. Okay, I mean, maybe uh, Norman might want to come in and just talk in a bit more detail about that one. Yeah, the issue of uh, goods at risk uh, is really around uh, the, the, the tariff uh, regime that might apply. Now, obviously, this is very much linked into the, the negotiations that are ongoing between uh, UK and, uh, uh, and the EU. And certainly, I think everyone would very much like to see a, a zero tariff, a zero quota uh, agreement um, being reached. In the event that that doesn't happen, uh, then there's then an issue of, uh, under the protocol, whether tariffs may apply um, on goods coming in to Northern Ireland from GB. Uh, and the way that it is framed within uh, the protocol, uh, it all depends on whether there is a risk of those goods uh, moving on uh, through Northern Ireland uh, into the rest of the, the single European market. Uh, and so this, this issue of defining at risk uh, is a key issue. That is something that uh, should be uh, effectively agreed within the, the joint committee uh, arrangements under the protocol. Uh, but what you have uh, is, uh, I suppose, uh, the, the UK government uh, wanting to basically remove 
that uh, that risk uh, of not uh, not coming to a conclusion around that, uh, and so it, it talks about uh, taking certain powers around state, uh, around that, uh, and that potentially could come forward under under the finance bill. But these are things that are all very much in play at this point in time, um, and so we can't really say uh, how this will will, will uh, play out. But clearly. Uh, if, if we end up with a zero tariff, zero quota uh, trade deal with Europe, then all these things fall away. Um, so it's all very much still to play for. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I mean, yeah, I think you're right. Indeed, it is still all very much to play for until we're here. I mean, so I really look forward to hear what this finance, finance bill has to say. Just to finish, what if we're not on the same foot? What proper reasons are in place if we're not? Um, and, uh, in terms of the contingency arrangements, what happens if not? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, maybe just uh, we could touch on that maybe again. Robert, do you want to? Okay. So, the, as Mark did said in some detail, um, we are making significant contingency plans for the events of, of there being no deal. But as I said at the very beginning, um, the, the, the amount of checks, the pure, the pure requirement for physical checks, um, particularly on the supermarket goods, would be beyond what we, we in all likelihood could deliver. So we're, we're moving forward in good faith. We're, we're planning against a reasonable worst case scenario. We have a number of scenarios, as Mark outlined, that we're, trying, that we're working against. And you know, all I can... Uh, I assure everyone here and, and f folks listening is that we are doing our very best to ensure that the hassle and hold up for traders bringing goods into Northern Ireland will be as be minimised to, to whatever effect we can we can give it. But we really do have to wait until we get um, some clarity from the outcomings of the negotiations, and and that's now only weeks away. But we're not waiting, waiting on that. We're getting on with it because time is of the essence. Um, we were doing a bit of work yesterday and it suddenly hit me. We've got 60 days until Christmas. If you were only working five days a week, that would be a nice idea. Um, but it is a relatively short amount of time in which to do an awful lot of, uh, of work still ahead of us. Okay, well, listen, for myself, thank you very much for all that you're all doing. It's much appreciated and I know it's not easy. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Bye -bye. Um, William, you're going to back in there? Yeah, in relation to COVID, uh, what impact has COVID had on your ability to deal with the situation? I think COVID's had a, had a huge impact generally. You know, it's um, um, it, 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 as it has on all sorts of work. I suppose um, there's a couple of elements to that. I mean, one of the things was um, with the previous sort of... Um, uh, previous runs on the supermarkets where people were working, uh, were, uh, queuing for goods and uh, buying more than they needed in uh, many cases. Uh, what happened was uh, we found ourselves having to take a much greater focus on food security. And uh, Mark's talked about that. That's become so, and, and it's actually a very useful thing. And by the way, I suppose just to say on that, it's been good to see how robust the uh, supply systems have been and continue to be. So just to say that, and, and that we have no, no reason to believe otherwise, uh, that, that, that that continues to be the case. Uh, so we focused a lot of our attention. We went through all of the um, normal emergency planning uh, around uh, central contingency group in the morning every day. Um, that meant we, um, it obviously then put a lot of the discussions that we need to have into onto the back foot for a period of time, and I'm talking about at an at a international and uh, UK level. Um, so all of those things have definitely had an impact. Um, again, delaying um, the start of the date because we had the lack of clarity, which we still have. Um, but uh, you know we, we're we're doing our best within that context just to to uh, try to work at speed to make up for as much of that as possible through the operational side. I think we're, it has proven that businesses have great ability to adapt. Uh, and I think even in relation to Brexit, business can and will adapt if they have to. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing that was great out of 
uh, COVID for all of its uh, tragic consequences, one of the things that did work well was the fact that we got very quickly into a situation where we met three times a week with the industry, um, from farm to fork. And actually, we continue to do that. So we have a meeting next week, um, and we, we just consistently do that. And I think the sort of communication that was referred to earlier, I think we're going to need to broaden that out using the same approach. And we've learned an awful lot about technology um, from this. You know, we, for example, last week, I think it was, we had uh, uh, one of our team meetings now with 600 people just come along to it. And everybody hears it firsthand. So that's what we try to do to, to keep, and we need to do that with the industry now, and we're, we're going to be starting to do that. As I say, we've been reluctant. We didn't want to, to be going out when people say, well, you can't give us any answers here. But actually, we're at the point now where we're just going to say, here's what we're doing. Here's the contingency arrangements we're putting in place. Here's the information we're waiting for, and have an honest conversation and listen to their views about how to respond. That'll be our next step. Get, getting 100 stakeholders, William, in a room under normal circumstances three times a week is unthinkable. Now we do it like that. That's good. And it's, uh, it, it's one of the great benefits. Um, people talk about returning to normal. Well, I don't want to. Um, I frequently sit in my conservatory with my headphones on from 8 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock at night in one meeting after the other um, with my wife, who's also working at home, bringing me in a lunch. Um, but we wouldn't have thought about doing that beforehand. And like the rest of you, working away at emails when you're doing other things on, on meetings because you can't do nine hours of meetings in a day. So there, there is a different way of working, and there's an awful lot of it that's better. Um, the bit you miss is the people bit, and you know the chatting around the age and the social interaction and the, the mental welfare piece, which is a really big issue for us all in, in trying to manage, manage our people. Um, and, and you don't have the same opportunities to work out what's going on in people's lives um, so that you can adapt and help um, that you do when you're actually meeting people. And that, that's a big challenge. But as far as meeting stakeholders and engaging on something as difficult as this, you know, um, you know, actually working um, within a department, it's efficient. Um, you know, so COVID, Brexit, you know, all I need is one of my favourite diseases in the autumn time, and we really will have a bit of a challenge. But you know, these are all unknowns. Deal with what's in front of us, and. Um, you know, we're, we're moving forward, and I, I, you're paying tribute to all of us. I, I'm going to focus on Mark and, and his team, and the, the work they've done over the last few months has just been, you know, 26th of, 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 of May, when we got out of the us to have an outline business case through finance and treasury, to have identified your sites, have your plans to Europe, and uh, for the first time on the 30th of June, you know, we have replies to Europe ready to go back on, on adapted plans. A huge amount of work. Yep. And I think you know, the committee is appreciative of that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, can I uh, ask a question? Was, uh, Claire, Claire Bailey, who sent her apologies, she's unable to be here today, has uh, sent in um, a question that she would like to ask. Um, is it, could the Internal Market Bill affect any future legislation here on minimum farm gate pricing? Norman, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, sort of. Uh, I just want to take you back to a uh, more fundamental issue about uh, the, the value of minimum uh, farm gate pricing. Uh, at the end of the day, we're a trading region. Uh, we're an outward looking region. Uh, we need to be able to compete. Um, and if we start to move in, in the direction of minimum uh, farm prices, we will undermine our capacity uh, to trade. Uh, to be competitive, uh, so there's there, there's much more fundamental issues with uh, uh, minimum pricing legislation, um, and, and therefore I don't even think we need to get to the point of considering whether it might um, uh, in, in some way uh, cut across what's in the internal market bill. Um, I think there, it has more fundamental problems than that. I suppose I have no real follow-up. I think the question wasn't really about the principle of farm gate pricing, uh, um, but in terms of if, if there was in the future uh, legislation here, I know that's been a demand of some of the, the farming groups. The, the, um, do, you, do you think that that would have any impact on any potential, most hypothetical potential um, 
Legislation. Yeah, I mean, if, if you look into some of the, the very uh, fine detail of the bill, there, there are certainly uh, par, or powers in there that effectively prevent, I think, uh, the 12 administrations uh, bringing forward legislation that would cut across uh, the issues that are set out within the uh, Internal Market Bill. Uh, remember, this is about trying to ensure that the internal UK market does function effectively. Uh, and therefore, uh, there are uh, measures in there to ensure that um, anything that may be brought forward by devolved administrations does not undermine the, uh, the effective functioning of the internal market. So that is, the, there, there are uh, provisions within the, the bill to do that. So, so just in a nutshell then, uh, and, um, I'm guessing that's clause 49, which is the uh, protection of the Act Against Modification. In a nutshell then, do you believe that, that this Act, this Internal Market Bill Act, would effectively um, prohibit any potential um, legislating of, legislation of minimum foreign gate pricing here? Um, potentially, I mean, it's just something that I haven't, I haven't looked at uh, through, through that lens. Um, I say we would have much more um, deep-seated issues uh, with the minimum uh, price legislation before we would even get to the point of considering it against uh, the internal market uh, bill. Uh, it, could, it, it could even fall foul of the state aid um, uh, provisions that we will be operating under as, as well. So there, there will be many more Mm -hmm. uh, issues that we need, we need to con consider before we even get to the point of considering it against the internal market bill. No problem. Th thank you very much. Okay. Oh, right now. So, listen, I'd like to um, thank you very much, Dennis, and indeed all of the officials here today. Um, we, we do appreciate the very, very constrained circumstances and pressurised circumstances are under, and we, we really do recognise the and we really appreciate the fact that you just came here this morning and answered all of our questions with very um, uh, detailed answers. Uh, so I want to thank you for, the, for your attendance. And we're going to suspend now for five minutes while the tables and chairs are, cle are, um, are cleaned. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Five minutes. Carry on. Yeah, yeah. So just now I've said Sorry, that. if we if we go back to page fifteen sixteen and the request from the House of Lords for a meeting. What items are to tell her? Okay, page fifteen to sixteen of your pack, paragraph mm. six, seven, and eight. Just can check that the committee's content that that meeting's organised. Okay, so you've heard Stella there. Uh, the House of Lords have requested another meeting. So if, are people happy that we go ahead and do another yeah. meeting? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> And do we have to organise a date, Stella, now? I'll, I'll contact them and get a date that suits everybody. I'll maybe try and do it on a Tuesday lunchtime. Okay. That day. I'll try that anyway. Okay, so then we're, we're now moving on to item number six, which is the, an oral briefing update on the fisheries bill. So can I refer members to the following papers in their pack? Memo from the clerk at pages one, two, six... 124, that's a typo, 124 to 126 maybe, uh, and then the Fisheries Bill Supplementary LCM at pages 135 to 138, and the ERA Committee LCM report on the Fisheries Bill at pages 139 to 165. So there's a response uh, from the ANIFOP and the uh, C-Source, NIFPO and the NI Marine Task Force on the amendments to the Fisheries Bill, that's also included on page 3 to 15 of the table uh, papers. So can I just welcome via Starleaf, uh, Claire Vincent, uh, Paddy Campbell and David Steele uh, and invite Claire and her colleagues maybe to begin their presentation. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Chair, can you, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. That's good. That's great. Um, so the last time we were with you uh, giving uh, oral evidence was on the 5th of March, just before lockdown. And we had a full discussion um, on the contents of the bill. And, and you heard from your research officer on the same date. Uh, and as you've mentioned, uh, the committee has, has produced a report. So we want to give you an update today on where we've got to and give you a little bit of context on the timing um, as well. Um, so, as you know, the, the bill has completed its uh, committee stage in the House of Commons on the 15th of September. 
and we were told just around the 9th of September that the report stage could be commenced as early as the 5th of October. It now actually seems more likely that that's going to be on the week beginning the uh, 12th of October. But as it stands, the actual date has still to be announced. So again, they, they've pulled the timetable forward um, and or potentially they're mo pulling the timetable forward in Westminster. Um, the report stage is the final amending stage and therefore we need the Assembly's legislative uh, consent before that date. And we then have to start working immediately towards an earlier date. Working back from uh, the Westminster dates, the latest date that the Assembly uh, debate could take place was the 29th of September. Um, and that, that's the date that has now actually been scheduled. Uh, with the Minister tabling a legislative consent motion on the 17th of September and uh, uh, laid a supplementary memorandum on the 18th of September, um, which was in, uh, has, has been included in your packs for today. And um, we understand this has resulted in a really constrained um, time frame for, you, for yourselves, which um, I is, is not acceptable, um, but unfortunately, from our point of view, it's been unavoidable. So just want to apologise um, for how that has happened. Um, but uh, as Dennis has mentioned earlier, on some of these legislative timetable things, they are out with our control, um, just with the, the, the busyness of, of Westminster uh, at the moment. So I, I hope that gives you a little bit of context as to why um, we're here today. And um, if you're um, content with that, I will move on to summarising some of the changes um, that are, first of all, some of the changes that have um, are, are actually stand now as part of the bill. And then uh, after that, maybe some further ones that we're anticipating within the uh, uh, coming weeks. Um, so if you're content, I'll, I'll, I'll move through those, Deputy Chair. Okay. Um, so, um, turning to the supplementary memorandum, it's been laid with a view to identifying the UK government amendments that now stand uh, as part of the bill following the committee stage. And these all require the Assembly's legislative consent. So, looking at them in turn, um, under clause Clause 2 has been amended to extend the time period by which the joint fishery statement must be published from 18 months through to 24 months. Um, the second one is that Schedule um, 6 has been amended to introduce uh, a, a new requirement to publish specified information about assistance given under financial assistance schemes. Um, the third uh, amendment uh, concerns ourselves, well all of these concern ourselves, but this, this one's specific to Northern Ireland. It amends the Northern Ireland uh, Wildlife Order 1985 um, in order to remove the option of granting a license to kill seals for the purpose of present, preventing serious damage to fisheries. Um, the, the next amendment is in uh, clause 49, includes a revised definition of minimum conservation uh, reference size to give uh, greater legal clarity around this point. And um, the last one is in schedule four, part two amends the sea fishing licenses and notices regulations, uh, 2014 Northern Ireland, um, to introduce an expedite uh, process for the communication of temporary fishing licenses. So say those are the changes that have already been uh, made. So we can either, um, if there's any of those you would like to discuss now, we can do that now, or I can also throw in then the anticipated um, uh, changes that we think will happen in the next few weeks as well. Okay. Um, so go ahead. Thank you, Claire. For Do you want me to go on ahead? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. With, so, so those ones that I've just discussed are the changes that are already in. Um, the anticipated, uh, the further anticipated changes include, um, we, th we think um, there will be an amendment to clause uh, 46 and schedule 9 of the Marine and Coastal Access Act to provide DARA with the powers to regulate fishing for marine conservation purposes in Northern Ireland's offshore region. Um, there will be uh, there'll be a, a, an amendment of a number of um, statutory rules to ensure that the restrictions and requirements provided by them apply equally to all fishing vessels licensed to fish in the Northern Ireland zone. 
and um, also then to provide powers for DERA and the other devolved administrations to enter into joint working, joint working arrangements. So we think those will also come up in the next um, table that they're to be tabled at the report stage. And I've, I've got David uh, still with me and Patty to uh, uh, on the around legislative process and also the background to um, some of these fisheries amendments. Uh, so we're happy to take um, any of your um, questions. Um, it'll be tomorrow or Monday before DEFRA uh, have, have cleared uh, all of these, the, 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 those latter uh, amendments that we've been talking about, and it hopes to publish those on Monday or Tuesday of next week. So as you can see, the timetables are um, squashed and, and, and overlapping, um, but we're doing our best to, to work through uh, and give you uh, as, as much a chance to, um, to, to discuss these as possible. Thank you for that, Claire. Um, I suppose one of the questions that would be to you was that in previous times we were taking some evidence on the fisheries bill. Um, one of the decisions we had made was that the permanent secretary would write to the NAO regarding the ter territorial dispute around Loch Foyle. Um, has there been any response to this, or what's the situation in regard to Loch Foyle? <laughs> Yes, Declan. The, there has been um, there. Uh, I believe the minister. Um, I would. I would actually have to check my records. Uh, I know that we have um, that uh, we have provided some briefing on this issue, um, and we were going to uh, we were requesting that the minister was going to um, to to write. Uh, but I, I'm going to have to check up on that and see uh, what has actually happened over over the summer period. I know that we have uh, briefed on on the issue, um, but I'm not sure. I, I wouldn't want to say yes. That has actually been actioned um, without checking first. If uh, and perhaps I can come back in 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 writing to you on that. Yeah, that's, that's perfect, Claire. Thank you, um, John. Uh, thank you, sure. Uh, thank you also, Claire and others. Good, good to see you all. Um, a couple of quick questions, uh, mostly the second one around the amendments, first one around the extension to the uh, time frame for the joint fisheries statement. Can I just ask if, if full consideration was given to any impact that extension might have on the sea fisheries sector and if conversations took place with the sector in relation to, to any impact? And the second question on the amendments, whatever, whatever the outwork of the amendments, um, if I could hone in on sustainability, uh, are the department involved in conversations with um, environmental organisations in relation to that sustainability argument, and also will those conversations continue, whatever the outcome of the current process? Thank you, John. Um, on the on the joint fisheries statement, the, the, the amendment has been to give more time um, to uh, you know change it from 18 months uh, post royal assent to, through to 24 months to be agreed uh, between the administrations, and we're working closely with industry um, in, in in all of the in all of this, and a wee bit like the evidence you were hearing earlier, um, we have been actually at the start of the COVID. Part we were for the first three or four months we were actually meeting on a weekly basis with with industry, um, talking about COVID issues, but also then coming into transition issues as well. And it's probably fair to say we're talking with them weekly uh, at the moment as well. So it's good close working. Um, we have also been talking to the um, the environmental NGOs um, on a regular basis um, as as well uh, and running. Um, Web, webinars and WebEx type meetings as well there. Um, on the sustainability issue, uh, so I, I am not sure, I maybe, might maybe hand over to Patty whether we talked specifically to them about that and I assume you're referring to the, the, the Lords wanted the sustainability objective yeah. um, elevated. Um, and, and that has been overturned uh, because the, uh, by, by government, in that they want a, a kind of a, a level playing field uh, across um, all of the objectives. And um, I think we're, we're actually supportive of that because obviously sustainability is about that balancing act already, about environmental, um, social and, and economic 
Um, so there, there could have been unintended consequences from elevating that and that uh, sustainability is, is also about uh, the economic um, and, and, and social. So, um, but I'll, I'll maybe hand over to Paddy uh, to see if he can say any more um, on that. Okay. Thank you, Claire. Can, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yep, good. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so sustainability, there were uh, issues around sustainability uh, carried through the Lords. Um, there was no specific uh, consultation with environmental NGOs um, during that period, um, because it was been taken through really the Parliament. However, the, the sustainability is you know, right through the rest of the objectives. We've got a sustainability objective, a costly objective, an ecosystem objective. So there's plenty of um, environmental protections in there. Um, when these objectives were being developed, uh, a lot of them were, the first four certainly are um, replicated from uh, the common fisheries policy itself. And uh, the additional one, one of the additional ones has been put in uh, by the government is the, is the climate change objective, so that's new and that's very important. Uh, as regards engagement with stakeholders, Claire's mentioned we've been meeting regularly with the fishing industry. Um, and taking forward the joint fisheries statement, uh, what we have set up in each part of the UK is a community of interest group. So we have a, a stakeholder group in Northern Ireland that includes the fishing industry processes, includes the, the Marine and Northern Ireland Marine Task Force. And we will be engaging with them on drafts of the uh, joint fisheries statement. That drafting has started, it's very, still very early stage, but as that draft gets more developed, we'll be sharing that with this group and taking their views on how that joint fisheries statement is achieving the objectives as we go forward. Um, on the point about the extension, the main reason for the extension from 18 months to 24 months is to take account of um, elections, uh, so that there's assembly elections and uh, legislative ele elections uh, throughout the UK, and when we, it's really purely technical as to why we've had to have that extension because we have to allow for the elections in various part of place, uh, part of periods um, throughout um, the, the UK. So that's the only reason for that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello. Thank you, Chair. Just following on from John's uh, question in, in regard to the environment, I mean, it, does this bill allow for uh, developing standards with environmental standards in the sea, uh, you know, in the Irish Sea, north and south? Uh, I mean, it would be ludicrous that we don't have uh, the freedom to develop all Ireland standards for our waters. Uh, so that's one question. Second question then. Uh, it's just kind of following on from the chairs with regard to uh, Loch Foy. It doesn't mention Carlingford Loch at all in this. So, I mean, I'm wondering, is there a similar dispute uh, in terms of the ownership of Carlingford? And, and, and with regard to the, the impact on this bill, uh, I mean, if we don't have clarification on, on that, what, what's the implications in the bill uh, with regard to Loch Foy or indeed Carlingford Loch? And then the other thing, I mean, and I understand that this isn't uh, a responsibility of yours, just but uh, Claire was outlining the the kind of shortened time frame uh, compared to what we would normally expect. Uh, so I mean, even from our point of view, the knowledge of what we would be potentially consenting to, because there's so much unknown. Uh, I mean, we're talking even about uh, amendments that we don't even know. So, for example. Annex 2 of the protocol, how will it affect fishermen and tariffs, issues around immigrant workers, abandoned vessels, um, boats in one jurisdiction, docking in another? No, there's lots of unknowns in this that we are being asked to agree to when we don't actually have the answers to a lot of important questions. Okay, um, I'll, I'll try and work our way through those. Um, so your first question was around um, an all Ireland approach and an environmental. Uh, you know what's the impacts of that? And of course, so this this bill is about um, UK coming out of the common fisheries uh, policy, um, but we still um, are signed up so to uh, the, the, something uh, the European um, Marine Strategy um, Framework Directive. 
and that has come that uh, has been written into um, uh, local legislation the obligations under that and uh, one of the key underpinning um, uh, elements of that is the ecosystem approach and again we all within the the so that, that that's one aspect um, so in terms of environmental management we will be using the same approach as we are already using but also then within the um, the fisheries bill that it is still underpinned by the ecosystem approach and some would say actually that the fisheries bill takes us further as Paddy mentioned but there's now a climate change objective in there as well um, and, and so there's still a strong environmental underpinning um, to, to this bill. And there's still a need as well to work on a regional uh, basis. There's still, uh, where the UK will just, uh, will be, be um, uh, would be a, a coastal state um, uh, under the UNCLOS uh, the, the definitions, but that still would still be participating in uh, regional, regional fisheries management forums as well which again, all of that is underpinned by the, the, this ecosystem approach. Um, so there will be uh, plans, um, it, we'll still be participating in, in plans for the wider Irish Sea and, and um, those, those sorts of waters. I don't know, Paddy, do you want to add anything to that before we move on to the cross-border regions? Uh, the only thing I would add to that, in, in coastal state negotiations, um, there is the opportunity in coastal state negotiations for coastal states where there is a, a particular environmental problem to do with fisheries. They can agree and they have agreed in the past uh, joint approaches to management that's happened for cod in the North Sea, for example, where they've, they've agreed um, measures to uh, conserve cod. So it is possible in those uh, coastal state negotiations um, for the parties to agree uh, common commonality of some measures. Over. Okay. Okay. So, um, moving on to the the the, the disputed um, uh, territory part um, in the uh, in the border regions, um, you asked first, uh, Philip, if the if there were the same issues in Carlingford. Um, so, my understanding is that. Uh, that, that there is the same issue with disputed territory, but it's not as complex in Carlingford in that both, uh, both uh, countries, both the UK and the Republic of Ireland, um, are happy to have a, a kind of a gentleman's agreement, um, which runs down the um, shipping, uh, down the middle of the shipping channel um, between uh, the, uh, the northern side and the Republic of, of Ireland side, and that that works because basically the shipping uh, line runs broadly down the middle um, of the um, of Carlingford Lock. So that is why there's a difference there in terms of say shellfish aquaculture licensing, where uh, you know the uh, Northern Ireland will we will. Uh, um, uh, license aquaculture activities anything to the north of that um, shipping channel and uh, the Republic likewise will uh, do uh, fishing licenses on the or aquaculture licenses on the southern side of that line um, and, and that works and there's good uh, communication and uh, agreement between uh, between us all about the managing of aquaculture could be better but we're, we're working away um, at that um, the difference then with Loch Foyle is that there's no easy line just because of the shape of the coastline. Um, you couldn't run it. You couldn't run any agreement down uh, the shipping channel in that instance because it runs uh, along the, the, the Donegal coast, uh, and so that's why it is managed as a wild fishery, and that's um, where the the locks agency. I suppose it's worth actually saying that the, the, the main fisheries. Um, within um, Foyle and Carlingford are on the aquaculture side rather than um, the, 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 the catch sector um, activities. So that's why it comes into a different kind of um, uh, discussion. It's, it's more about how do you manage aquaculture in those circumstances. Um, and so the, in Loch Foyle, it is managed as a wild fishery. Um, and um, the locks agency have a role um, in that and they work with both ourselves and then their sponsor department um, in the, the Republic of Ireland. Again, it's not ideal, um, uh, but some of this needs a, a, a political will then at a higher level and that's as, um, 
as uh, the, the chair mentioned earlier, we we did uh, I think um, undertake to uh, to to take an action to um, write to Northern Ireland Office, I, and I think it was to ask for an update on that because it's really something for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in, in um, Dublin and uh, the uh, Foreign Office then in London to, 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 to sort out. But I th there was definitely an action that we were going to write to Northern Ireland Office and, and ask, or our minister was going to write and ask um, uh, as, as to what was the progress being made on that. And I, I just can't update on, as to where we are on that um, without checking uh, my, my notes um, on that. Um, the third thing you asked about, Philip, was just about the shortened time frame and you were concerned um, then that you weren't being fully cited maybe on all the issues. And then you referred to Annex 2 of the protocol and I think you'll find that we are scheduled again uh, to come and talk to you next week about the specifics um, around that. Um, so. Uh, Pally, do you want to say anything more, Pally or David? Do you want to say anything more around around that? Uh, I mean, could, could those I? are very specific to the protocol rather than to the rather than to um, the, the the fisheries bill. Yeah, if, I, if I could add a, a few words, uh, Chair. Um, yes, the, the Fisheries Bill, like many bills, is a piece of framework legislation. Um, so there are, as the committee will be uh, will be aware, uh, a number of associated uh, UK-wide SIs, uh, which we're working through. And as Claire has said, uh, we will be, be bringing to to the committee's attention. One of those one of those is a CFP20. Uh, and that uh, will deal uh, with uh, implementation of the protocol. And it's, it's, it's one of the ASIs that um, ourselves and uh, our legal are working through at the moment. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, see, see, just uh, one of the things I was thinking about as well. Obviously, with leaving the common fisheries policy, that's also mean that we're leaving uh, the funding from the EMFF. Has there been any clarity from the British government as to the um, replacement of that lost EMFF funding? Claire, do you want me to come in there? Yes, please, Pally. Yeah, uh, Chair. Uh, the position, I think, is as we uh, told the committee earlier on in the year, uh, the indications from uh, Treasury were that the funding would be certainly no greater than uh, it would have been under the EMFF, but uh, the intention at that stage there still would be funding for um, fisheries support. Uh, but that, of course, would be subject to um, spending review. So the spending review hasn't happened yet, so we haven't confirmation. Uh, none of it, none of us in the in the involved administrations, including uh, DEFRA, have confirmation of uh, the money that will be available. Um, what is happening in the meantime is we're developing uh, business cases. Uh, DEFRA have developed a, a, a UK-wide business case which is going forward to Treasury to justify uh, support. We'd have to do the same here to satisfy Department of Finance, but what we propose to spend money on fisheries in the future uh, gives us value for money and, and meets all the new objectives in, in the fisheries bill and so on. Um, so that, that is work in progress. Um, but no, we haven't had uh, we haven't had confirmation that there is a specific pot of money uh, being given to fisheries support to follow the EMFF. Uh, am I correct in saying that in the last or in the last round of the from the EU that a reason of fifteen million or something like that? Uh, we got we our share was about ten percent of the of the UK um, pot. So whatever is devoted to fisheries or given to us from fisheries from uh, Treasury, we expect to get around about ten percent of that. And and then just uh, before we move around again, see in relation, what what would be the implications of this uh, fisheries bill for the uh, the Vossenage agreement? Me again, Claire. Yes. Yes, Paddy. Go ahead. Right. Uh, yes, Chair. The. There's nothing in the, in the Fisheries Bill that prevents us from carrying on with the, the Vosnack Agreement, um, whether there's a, a wider fisheries agreement with the EU or there's not a wider fisheries agreement with the EU. Uh, if, if there is no agreement, uh, we can st a member state can still, um, can still fish in a third country's waters. 
with that third country's permission. So provided that um, the Republic of Ireland and themselves um, still wish was not to happen, um, and still allowable, the bill allows us to license uh, boats from the Republic of Ireland to fish in our waters if we if we want it to happen. And if um, if, um, if it's just have to be reciprocal, so if we're getting the same access for our inshore vessels, um, then there's no reason why that can't continue. Thank you, Barry. Um, uh, Harry. Thank you very much, Chair. Here in person now. Not okay. Barry. Appreciate it. And thank you, Chair and Polly. What can you tell me about the Hague preference, Claire, please? To start so, out. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, Hague preference is a very unpopular, um, it's been very unpopular with our um, fish, fisher, uh, fishers because um, it it uh, basically they uh, I mean, Patty could give you chapter and verse actually on hate preference, but my simple understanding of it is that um, it, it means that our our fishermen, uh, when we're assigning the various quotas, um, coastal states that are uh, reliant on um, on fisheries can invoke invoke Hague preference, and uh, of course UK can invoke Hague preference, but so can the Republic um, of Ireland. Uh, because fisheries is an important part of our economy. And what it actually means is that um, our quotas um, are, are, are uh, lessened because of this, because both countries are invoking uh, a Hague preference. So I'm not sure I've explained that very well, but it's very unpopular with our own fisher, fishers because they uh, they feel that they are they're, they're, they're for sure what actually happens is that the quotas that they uh, have, have are, are reduced um, when hate preference is invoked. So uh, that's they are very much looking forward to a time um, when we as, assert ourselves as a as a as a coastal state because. Um, we won't get those reductions in quota that currently happen under hate preference. Um, Paddy, did I get that right? Yes, yes, you got it. You got it right. I just, I just uh, elaborate a little bit. Um, uh, there's a, a fiendishly complicated uh, formula behind the hate preference, and it was developed right back at the start of uh, whenever we entered the common fisheries policy. It dates from the very first common fisheries policy that was developed. Um, and as Claire said, it, it reallocates some quotas to um, the UK and Ireland, who were deemed at that time to be uh, more dependent on fisheries than other places. What it means for the RSC, just to clarify, the way the formula works, it benefits yeah, the, the Republic of Ireland um, gets a greater share of RSC stocks, and the UK mainly benefits in the North Sea. So in Hague preference in book by both parties, uh, it tends to be stakeholders in Scotland benefit from North Sea stock increases, and we lose out in Northern Ireland because the RSC uh, quota shares go to um, are increased for the for the Republic of Ireland. It is a it is an artifact of the common fisheries policy. So when we leave Europe, finally, um, and we we will leave with our full what they call relative stability shares. We will be leaving, so Europe can't apply the Hague preference to us. Um, it's, it's our position. So we should benefit, we would expect to benefit um, from from leaving because the Hague preference won't be invoked in our share, so we won't lose that share. Good. Thank you, Chair. And so that obviously that'll please our fishermen and our stocks. Just another wee question, Chair, if that's okay, or comment. <clears throat> Having been round, um, most of our harbours are, in fact, probably all in the county down coast, Kilkeel, Portavogue, Arglas. Um, Infrastructure-wise, they all look as if they could do uh, improvements. I know Kilkeel would benefit from a new outer wall. Portavogue, I mean, the guys are there wanting to work. They could do with a bit more infrastructure, and they could do with some way to help them maybe get new boats, um, as well as or glass, which also could do a few benefits. Um, what can you tell me about infrastructure? Thank you. So, um, Harry, this is one um, which uh, an industry themselves are, are lobbying about uh, the need for new infrastructure around the ports. Um, we thought it was really important in taking any decisions there and any to do a strategic piece of work 
um, to look at the needs and opportunities, the needs within our, all of our ports and then the, oppor the um, opportunities that uh, we think, the future fishing opportunities that might arise from UK leaving. Um, EU, and so we commissioned a, a fish and seafood development program to look at all of those. Um, there's, uh, and I, I think the, the minister will shortly launch the, the, the phase one outcome of that, um, which uh, there, there, there's, a, there's a report um, uh, uh, nearly finalised on that. Um, which will outline uh, the issues and uh, the, the next steps. Um, some of this work was supposed to be uh, coming to a close, but actually with the, with the, uh, the, the new uh, Northern Ireland Protocol, um, we, we think it's actually really important that this work should not be closed out until um, such times as we know the, the, the outcome of that, because that is actually going to um, show us the shape um, of, of fishing, uh, future fishing opportunities and, and the industry uh, going forward. So we realise there's an impatience um, to, to, to get on with some of these, uh, with some capital investment, but there's a lot of steps to go through um, first. Uh, and uh, certainly notwithstanding the, the discussions and negotiations that have to go on in the next few months, that's going to be really important uh, backdrop to, to this piece of work. So we are um, on it and um, the, uh, we're doing that strategic piece. Um, and as I say, there should be uh, the, the phase one report should be uh, coming out uh, relatively uh, shortly. So I am. Um, Paddy, don't know whether you want to add anything more to that? Uh, no, just to add that the, the phase one part dealt with the catching sector and a lot of it was to do with the opportunities available to the catching sector. So that's why there's this, um, it can't be closed off until we know the outcome of the negotiations on future fisheries agreements and the implications of Northern Ireland Protocol, because that will obviously affect, um, or potentially could affect either to, to good or, or not so good, hopefully to the good, of the fishing opportunities available and, and therefore the case for uh, uh, major investment in infrastructure. Good. Okay, Claire. thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned two words there, Claire, needs and opportunities. Um, there is indeed much need and it's great that there's also the opportunities and I really look forward to the Fish and Seafood Programme report and I'd welcome it, so I look forward to seeing it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Okay, um, Claire or Paddy can also ask a question. Um, we we ex we export, I think, 80 to 90 percent of our fish caught here into the into the EU, and obviously, notwithstanding potential loss of the MFF funding and the implications over here, and the concerns about the access to American labour is so vital to the industry. Has the department considered the implications of a No Deal Brexit? Um, given the vital importance of the EU market for our exports and uh, fish and for American labour and, and indeed the fact that we have <coughs> fish in here as well. So we're, uh, yeah, we're very conscious um, of that um, and uh, we're, i say, I, I think you're going to hear uh, more evidence on this aspect and the implications of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, and how that works out um, next week, um, and we'll have Kieran Cunningham with us um, at that at that particular meeting. He's been leading on on all of that work. But as you heard from um, Robert Huey uh, and uh, Norman Fulton uh, previous to to this meeting, um, there's still an awful lot of uncertainty around that, and um, we are. Uh, working through uh, contingency and in, in, in those for those scenarios as well. We're still, um, as Robert Huey said, we're still working on Plan A, which is that we get what we think is a is a common sense um, outcome for the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, so and, and what we think is is workable, but there's certainly there's no certainty around that um, at the minute yet. But that we're we're working on ahead. Um, 
to try and make sure that everything, that industry is ready and that everything is in place that will um, satisfy um, EU to enable uh, trade to continue, uh, we're realising what an important uh, market um, that is. So that's our, we're still working away on, on plan A, even though there's not much certainty around plan A, um, we're working on contingency in the background and just trying to make sure that industry is as, is as ready as possible. And Relations are good. They are work. Uh, Industry is working really well with us and is aware, uh, very much aware of the risks here. So um, I think there's no doubt that UK is in a strong position in terms of uh, quota shares and things moving forward. But again, so much trade is done with e EU that we we need to keep that very much um, in in our sights as well. Thank you, Claire. Uh, Morris. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a, a, wee, uh, a wee query, really, uh, Chair. Uh, and it's to do with John's already alluded to it, and Philip to some extent as well, and that's the conservation uh, and the sustainability of, of the catch. Uh, I would like some, some to get in where the sustainability is set that the species can actually grow in numbers as opposed to this level playing field. That's really a comment. The other, the other thing is, that concerns me is the, uh, the rise in numbers of these super trawlers. I mean, it was in the, the news this week that some of them have a small, very, very fine mesh and they trawl from the bottom and they pick everything up. Mature fish, young fish, everything ends up in the nets. Uh, and that's a, that's a very, very dangerous thing, I think, for conservation in any, any waters. So is there anything in, in the bill that would ban such trawlers from entering the, the waters of the UK or Ireland. The committee report, paragraph 65. Paddy, do you want to say some, something about, uh, well, maybe I'll start off with just that they, in terms of managing the, the, the fish stocks, I mean, all of those decisions that are made around quotas and quota share, um, Morris, are uh, made with uh, sustainability in, in mind and, and maximum sustainable yield, and UK is still then Co committed um, to to that um, through this uh, fisheries bill and and ecosystem approach, so it's still very much at the heart of everything um, we do. Um, so that that uh, and and again we those those are the that's all managed through the science and the international uh, council for the exploration of the sea. So we have an extensive program um, within the Irish Sea done by AFBI for us, where we do extensive fish survey work. And all of that information is then fed into this ICES, International Council for the Exploration of the Seas. UK will still very much be using ICES to help advise on um, safe levels of fishing um, for stocks. And we will be then part, we'll be in uh, coastal state negotiations in future with uh, Norway, Faroes, and then also with the EU. Um, as to how those uh, the, the quotas are actually um, split up, but that's why the decisions are done every year because the it, it's based on the on the actual science that's provided and it changes year on year depending on how the fish stocks are doing. In terms and in terms of your 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 question around super trawlers, this is a really important point then about licensing. Um, uh, about licensing vessels that come into um, our, our waters, that they also observe um, the, 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 the conservation, um, uh, the, the, the strict conservation that we would uh, put on our own vessels. And, and I'll, I'll hand over to Paddy to uh, see if he wants to say any more uh, about that. Um, I would just, just add uh, that the, the maximum sustainable yield objective is still there in the bill. Um, so it, it is saying that we are committed to uh, maintaining the populations of harvested species above the biomass levels capable of producing maximum sustainable yield. So that's firmly there front and centre in the bill. And that is where fisheries management has been going over the last uh, five to ten years. And, and stocks, we are seeing stocks growing. So it's important that is there and we will continue to do that. Um, as far as the super trawlers, um, you know, we, we do, we, I guess we have maybe one vessel even in our own fleet that some, that's over 70 metres long that some people might class as a, as a super trawler. Now, it, it operates, um, doesn't operate usually on the RSC. It's normally uh, operating off uh, 
west coast of Scotland up into Norwegian waters. And that, that's what we call a pelagic trawler. So it's going for um, herring mackerel. Uh, so the nets are mid-water. They're not hitting the bottom of the seabed. But those boats, all those boats, and I know it's very emotive, and, and people get very excited when uh, they spot these big trawlers um, cruising around the dark shores. But they are all subject to um, strict quota control. Um, they are managed well. And there's not that very many of them, so it's easy to keep track of them. And it's the quotas, as long as they obey the quotas and uh, stick to the quotas, and that ensures that the stocks, that what they're taking out of the sea is actually sustainable. Okay. Chair, sure, thanks very much. Sure, thanks very much, Pally uh, and Claire. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, there's not many fishermen in, in my consistency, but I mean, as I see it, there seems to be optimism among fishermen. They the, the felt very badly done with in, the, in, in Europe for a number of years. Industry was decimated. So the, the appeal is opportunities. Uh, is there at this stage no clear guidance as to the extent of the whether or not they can fish in, in a greater pool of water to fish in at this stage, or is that not totally decided? I think it's important that, that the fishermen do benefit from Brexit because uh, I've seen a programme on TV from the Irish Republic one night and there's fishermen from Donegal that were saying we should believe in Europe along with them because they felt that they were getting a bad deal too. So there are, there are those in Northern Ireland, I think, fishermen that feel that there's opportunities there and it's important that they benefit from those. Yes, I, I think it's fair to say there is there is um, there is optimism. Um, as as we've already mentioned, they're very keen on this uh, ditching of the of the Hague preference. Um, but the uh, as you as you've probably got a wee flavour for this morning, it is extremely complex. Um, and uh, you know, there's there's issues. Our our own fleet um, does quite a lot of fishing in uh, Republic of Ireland EU waters as well. Um, so it's, there's a lot of there's a, it's a it's a delicate balance. And then of course there's the issue which uh, Declan's already raised about the, that a lot of our trade is actually with Europe. So it's it's extremely complex. Um, we are optimistic that there will be opportunities in future, and we're working um, as hard as we can to get the, the best uh, possible uh, deal for the, the Northern Ireland uh, industry here. And that's not only on all the, um, the coastal state negotiations, all the, those sorts of negotiations, but, but also that um, the outworkings of the, what does the protocol look like? And again, not much clarity around that yet. But um, how do we get the best possible um, deal for our um, industry uh, there? So. Yeah, it, it's complex, um, William, and, and we'll hear some more about the complexities of that um, next next week as as well. Okay. Okay. Um, and just uh, post finally, um, I just want to um, mention here that certainly in previous evidence gear we had, we we noted that we don't have full devolved competency here for marine conservation. And Minister Pitts wrote to DEFRA. Uh, requesting for uh, for consideration to be given for it to be for marine conservation to be fully dissolved a year through the fisheries bill. Has there been any update on that there, or David? Would you like to take that one? Yes, uh, certainly, Claire. Um, uh, there, there, there has been uh, updates on that. Um, let me just get that 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 information um, for you. Uh, bear, bear with me, sorry. Yeah, there's uh, the, 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 there, there will be additional powers in terms of the, the regulation of fishing uh, uh, in, in Northern Ireland waters, but what won't be included in the bill uh, will be f the, the power for, for DERA to um, designate offshore uh, marine sites. Uh, and the reason behind that is that uh, there will be certain functions there um, that don't really relate either to uh, marine conservation or to aquatic animals. Um, so uh, it was decided then that that fell outside um, of, the, of the scope of the fisheries bill. Uh, now we had um, uh, looked to see whether uh, there would be an alternative legislative vehicle available, um, but uh, at the present time there isn't. 
um, but that's something that uh, we're, we're, we're looking into. And what sort of an alternative legislative vehicle might that? What shape would that take? Well, it's, uh, I suppose it's it, it's one that we can 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 get these uh, powers in, included in. Um, so it would be another another piece of uh, primary legislation that we would be um, be looking for um, that uh, it would be found acceptable to include these uh, powers in. We we did look. Um Declan, we did look at the UK Environment Bill as well to see what, when we heard it was outside scope of the UK Fisheries Bill, we looked at UK Environment Bill, um, but again, it, it's outside scope there, um, but this is something the Minister has raised with uh, the uh, Deaf for Fisheries Minister, Minister Prentice, um, this week actually, um, and uh, we you know, that I think there is a willingness in Westminster to give that full devolution um, of, of the offshore zone um, to uh, um, to Northern Ireland. So we'll keep uh, putting pressure on there. And we also then, we will be, we're looking at a legislative program next year. Once we get through this, we're looking to start next year on um, the 1966 uh, Fisheries Act for Northern Ireland. Um, so that is a potential vehicle that um, we could maybe, uh, you know, with with um, the consent of um, the Secretary of State, um, that we could. That, so there is a, a potential legislative vehicle to take that through um, there. Um, and I'm hoping I've got that right because David, uh, David's uh, he's nodding there, so uh, he, he's much uh, much sharper on all the on the legislation side than I am. But uh, it's we're not going to lose sight of that one, Declan. We will be keeping it on the agenda, and the minister is um, is very keen that we get the full um, devolution kind of settlement for the Northern Ireland offshore um, area. Um, you know. Uh, as soon as possible, actually. Yeah, if I could just I'd just concur with what uh, Claire has said there, Chair. That uh, certainly once we once we have this uh, UK uh, uh, government fisheries bill um, out of the way, um, that we will be turning our attention then to to scoping um, what requirements so uh, uh, might be needed in uh, domestic legislation uh, here in Northern Ireland. Okay. Um, Rosemary. Yeah, just one last last question for. Um, and that's in relation to abandoned vessels, end of life vessels. Is there any progress on the removal of them or trying to get them disposed of properly rather than them just being abandoned along the coastline? I'm going to hand over to Paddy, sent me something on this recently, so uh, I'm going to ask Paddy to pick this one up, please. Yeah, we have plans. Uh... On a practical level, we have plans to uh, establish um, a licensed facility in uh, Port of Ogie. Um, that is currently at the planning stage and we're waiting planning approval for that once that goes ahead. That will give a, a, a practical and more cost-effective solution for uh, fishermen to take ex-fishing vessels to, because currently there, there isn't a, a practical or cost-effective solution in Northern <laughs> Ireland. Um, separate to that, um, we will have to look at um, what can be done about uh, the regulating of disposal of vessels generally, because this problem uh, is most frequent at the moment with fishing vessels. There are also larger uh, non-fishing vessels um, that also get abandoned uh, from time to time. Uh, the registration of vessels uh, in the UK is a matter for the Department of Transport, um, so they look after registry of vessels, um, safety of vessels and things like that. Uh, so it's a matter we, we could raise with them. That's also something that perhaps we could look at internally. Um, so we are looking at um, possible greater regulation to try and um, ensure that vessels are disposed of uh, safely and, and without harm to the environment. Um, so. There is progress being made. Certainly the first thing we have is this, this uh, we want to do is to find a, a, a suitable facility here that these vessels can be taken to. And I think that would, be a, that would go a long way to, to reducing the problem. And finally, Philip. Yeah, I mean, just a, I suppose a brief question. I mean, this has been debated 
uh, and the assembly on Tuesday. What, what happens if the assembly doesn't um, allow legislative consent? What impact will it have legislatively and for the fishing industry? That would leave us in a, a, a real problem if, um, because that would mean we would have to um, make the, our own primary legislation and you'll all be aware of just how long that, uh, so if, if, if Northern Ireland was kind of writ, written out of the, um, of the UK Fisheries Bill, it would mean we wouldn't, we'd be facing the 1st of January um, without, uh, the, without the, 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 the framework um, uh, or anything to replace the common fisheries policy, which would leave us in a, 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 a very uh, poor state. Um, so um, I don't know whether Paddy or uh, David wants to say uh, more around that. Yeah, I think uh, if I could just add a, a few words, um, Chair. Um, certainly, yes. If we if we weren't to be part of uh, this this fisheries bill, then clearly any of the provisions in it. Uh, wouldn't extend to Northern Ireland. So, for example, uh, when we talk about the joint fishery statements and uh, being able to set out um, policies within it to achieve all of the objectives, the the, the high level objectives, uh, then uh, we, we 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 wouldn't be able to take that forward. <coughs> um, I'd also add, we wouldn't be able to license uh, effectively either our own vessels or. Um, uh, other vessels uh, that have access to UK waters, we wouldn't have the powers to uh, uh, fund future fishery support either. So those are all in the bill. So there's a lot of stuff in the bill that we need. Okay, Fab. Thank you very much. So um, that's the m members um, have asked questions who want to ask them. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you very much, David, Paddy and Claire, for your briefing and for attending to answer all the questions. So I want to thank you very much. Um, I want to remember, remind members that the debate on the LCM for this bill will take place next Tuesday, 28th September. As a chair, I will outline the views of the committee as per the committee report. However, we have heard additional evidence today on further amendments to the bill. And... Um, so if there's anything that you want reflected in the speech for next week. Sorry, are we going to have a closed session to discuss that, or are you locking the views now? No. All right, okay. Do you want a closed session? I think I have a few questions that I would potentially like to ask in closed session, if that was possible. Okay. For time. Okay. Okay, can I ask that the, the comms to be aware that we are going into a private session um, and the witnesses, um, the witnesses, we could, the witnesses and all members please remove witnesses and put all members into the spotlight as a message to the comms. Okay, I'm going to be back in 10 minutes for comms. Okay. Okay. Um, we're going to receive now an oral briefing uh, from the department on the approach to EU exit updates and secondary legislation. Just need to see that they all come back in again. Are they were there with Paul Rosemary now? Oh no, here we go. Rosemary's here now, and Ken, or Keith, um, Kevin. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. I uh, refer members to the dear response to issues raised at the meeting on the 11th of September on pages 167 to 170, the outline timetable uh, on 171 and 176, DFT, DEIS, SIs, laid 4 31st of December at pages 177 to 181, the table of changes uh, between 10 and 14 December at page 182. Um, I also refer members to the email from the Clerk Assistant Paul Gill, page 183 to 84. And the fourth paragraph, he set out the role of the committee, and I quote, Is the committee is content with the Minister of Proposal to agree to the EKG make a statutory instrument to um, whatever SA concerns? It's not the case that the committee is being asked to, scrut to scrutinise a draft SA. It is a question of whether the Minister of Department should agree to doing that doing this that is relevant. And that's the finish of the quote. The email goes on to suggest the committee might be actively opposed to the 
proposal either on its own merit or on the grounds that it believes that if there was any such legislation, it would be a statutory rule made by this minister and subject to usual assembly scrutiny. And or the committee does not believe that it has sufficient information or time to make an informed decision. In this case, the committee may wish to either oppose the minister's depart or department's proposal or not to take a decision at all. Can I also remind members that as discussed last week, the draft SA will no longer be provided to the committee. This information will be found at page 169, the fourth paragraph. The committee will be asked to make its decision based on the summary of what may be in the SA. I want to inform members that we have not yet received the guidance for, department, for departments as being drafted by TDO and is apparently being provided to the Speaker via the Assembly. I want to inform members that having checked, the Scottish Parliament do not have did not receive a copy of the SA either. Before we get involved in discussing the details of this approach, can I suggest that I should listen to the presentation from Dira and then have a closed session to discuss the matter. I want to welcome by Starleaf, um, Rosemary. Rosemary, yes, Rosemary, yes. Rosemary Agnew and Kevin, yeah, Kevin Murphy as well, head of Brexit. Yep. Yeah. Kevin and Rosemary, can I invite you to begin your presentation? Okay. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, um, again, thank you for the invitation to speak to you again on the department's approach to both to EU exit updates and to the and on the secondary legislation program. Um, as you said, today I'm accompanied by Kevin Murphy, who is head of Dara's secondary legislation team. Um, hopefully today, and I'm. It looks quite positive now um, that the IT systems seem to be working better than they were when we met two weeks ago, and hopefully they will continue. Um, I understand just from what I've heard you say, Chair, that you would like me to focus on the content of the letter and the department issued to you following our last attendance. Um, that letter contains a lot of detail, and all I can try to do in the few minutes that I have, because I appreciate that you're running over, is to try and highlight the main points covered in that letter. But both Kevin and I would be happy to address any of your further concerns or queries. I do hope you give me latitude to speak sort of maybe for about seven minutes or so as part of this introduction and um, just to cover the main issues. So turning firstly to the department's approach to providing the committee with EU exit updates. Um, I want to thank you for agreeing to fortnightly written updates on our EU exit preparation until the end of October. That's very helpful to us. And hopefully you, you've heard a very comprehensive overview this morning from our permanent secretary. In our letter, um, we proposed that some adjustments were made to the forward work, work program on EU exit issues after today's committee meeting to address the, in, the need for increased focus on the legislative program. And the letter has sought your agreement that Dara presents to you each week on what we have referred to as thematic type areas. And I think in the, some of the discussion that I picked up on this morning during the meeting, um, you'll have heard we were talking about, for example, next week talking about fisheries trade negotiations, a general update on trade, and then all the associated pieces of legislation. And I'm just picking that out as an example. I do appreciate that members have raised a number of concerns with this approach, and in particular that this was a change from the business group approach that had already been agreed by the committee. The reason for the suggested new approaches that were possible, and I have to say subject to the receipt of information on the UK-wide SIs from Whitehall departments, DERA officials will bring forward as many of the SIs and SRs at the same meeting to provide a more cohesive and comprehensible approach to the committee, as EU exit issues do not sit easily in the department's group structure. Such an approach hopefully will provide the committee with sufficient information in the one meeting to carefully consider um, the department's EU exit preparations. It would be extremely helpful if the committee could let us have its view on these proposals for the EU exit aspects of the forward work programme as soon as possible to assist in our planning purposes and to ensure that we get papers to you in sufficient time. Um, but it's important that I say to you at this stage, it is very unlikely that we, it is very likely, sorry, that we will continue to seek flexibility around some of the SI and SR presentations. And as I continue, hopefully I will outline why. Chair, turning now to the legislative programme, 
I welcome the opportunity to provide further clarification on what is a very challenging and complex task to ensure the department meets its objective of ensuring there's a functioning rule book at the end of the transition period of the 31st of December. Um, before I look at the content of the letter, Chair, I just want to say a couple of things about um, the context um, of the, or the environment in which we are all working. This is important because as issues are arising which are completely beyond the direct control of DARA officials, and I know you've talked a little bit about that this morning um, during your, your meeting, but this may have a knock-on effect for the Committee's Forward Work Programme. As I said last time, and as I think you now appreciate, DARA is the civil service department in Northern Ireland most impacted by EU in terms of its legislative process. And we're developing procedures and processes while at the same time being heavily involved in the work to ensure that legislation can be laid in the challenging deadlines and timelines. Also, as a result of pressures on UK parliamentary time and ongoing EU-UK negotiations, the timing and content of the UK-wide SIs are and will be subject to regular change, and this creates issues for our work planning. We're often notified at very short notice about these changes. So if we were to meet our overall secondary legislation programme objectives, flexibility will be key in achieving that. As a department, we fully recognise the risks to the secondary legislation programme and we're taking action to mitigate these as far as possible. And you will have heard um, this morning discussion around the programme assessment review or the gateway review of our overall programme, turning it to red. And that equally applies to our legislative programme. And what we're trying to do is to rebase the programme and mitigate as many of the risks as possible. So, I would like just for a few minutes to proceed to provide clarification on the key points of the department's letter to the committee on the 16th of September. As you said during your introduction, Chair, um, since I last met with you, we have been advised by UKG that the draft UK-wide SIs cannot be shared with the Northern Ireland Assembly Committees or the Assembly more widely before they've been presented to UK Parliament. This is completely out with our control. The approach of using UK-wide SIs has been agreed by the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Interministerial Group. Minister Putz sits on that, the Secretary of State, uh, Deputy Secretary of State George Eustace and the Scottish and Welsh Agriculture Ministers. Reason for this is it creates a consistent approach to common issues and makes more efficient use of resources across the four regions of the United Kingdom. Put quite simply, it's unlikely, almost impossible, that DARA would have the resources or the time to use domestic legislation in any case the UK-wide SI um, is identified. We recognise that it's vital that the committee can clearly identify the changes being introduced by the SIs and what it will mean for practitioners. And in our letter, um, we've tried to outline the types of information in some detail that we will endeavour to ensure that the committee is provided with. Um, without detail, it questions on it. On categorization of the SI, the committee has already received DARA's preliminary assessment of the category of each UK wide SI. Um, as the final draft SIs and associated documents are received from the Whitehall departments, we review these categories and inform the committee of any changes. But the committee can request information and or presentations on any of the SIs subject to time constraints. In light of your concerns, um, the letter also contains the detail of how we would now propose to handle the category of uh, each SI, in that the committee will be advised before the minister gives consent. And depending on whether it's a category one, two, or three, um, there will be different levels of information come to the committee but the committee has a right to request further information at any stage within this whole process. Um, happy to take questions on the categorization as we go through, but I would like to seek your agreement as soon as we can that the approach and categorization as outlined in the letter um, meets with the committee's approval and that you're content that that is adopted. Given the ever-changing environment, and particularly so since we last met, and Chair, you referred to it in your introduction, 
I would now propose that officials from DERA will seek the committee's agreement that the provisions of each UK-wide SI should be extended to Northern Ireland, and that's what the ask will be on each of the SIs. I would ask that the committee considers its role and confirms to the department how it sees its role in respect of these UK-wide SIs given the changing circumstances, and again confirms this to the department as soon as is practically possible. I need to mention um, the risk of no consent. It is up to the DERA minister to write back to DEFRA, indicating whether or not he agrees consent or not to the UK-wide SIs. If no letter, if a letter is not received within the timescale required, or consent is withheld, DEFRA could do two things. DEFRA could remove Northern Ireland from the territorial extent of the UK-wide SI, and the risks of that may be that there is no functioning rulebook in Northern Ireland on a number of areas, or DEFRA could choose to lay the SI anyway. The risk then is if Northern Ireland is not content, we would have to bring our own forward our own legislation in that space and at pace. On the latter point, we've already significant concerns, as I've said at the outset, about our ability to, to deliver the legislative programme, and that is something that the committee might wish to consider. Um, just remind the committee um, of the overall aim to have the functioning rulebook. Quickly, Chair, and I'm coming very quickly towards the end of what I want to say as part of my introduction. Um, Committee requested that DERA provided it with information on a number of additional points. Um, I trust the letter has covered most of these, um, and the work Kevin and I are more than happy to pick up on any of those um, that you wish us to. Um, we also note and accept that once the committee starts its consideration of the secondary legislation, the experience gained may influence its thinking, and it's likely that um, we need to make amendments to our approach. And I would suggest to the committee that we review how the system is operating between DERA and the committee towards the end of October, and we make any adjustments following that review. I want to confirm that as well as being available for further oral briefing at any future date, DERA officials will make themselves available to be called as witnesses when written briefing is being considered to allow most queries to be answered on the spot. And this may avoid a need for further oral briefing given the significant time constraints that we're facing and also the ever-changing environment. So in conclusion, just reiterate, we're operating in an area of work with very demanding timescales, and I trust what I've said you find helpful and happy to take any questions or queries the committee may have. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, William? Well, thank you for, for the explanations on the uh, presentation. Um, thinking what you did say there, if I picked it up right, all the regions of the UK, including Scotland and Wales, has agreed to this process in relation to the SIs. Is that right? I'm going to say, William, I only caught about half of what you said, all to me. So what you're saying. I think of what you said was that all the regions of the UK, including Scotland and Wales, have agreed to the process as to how the SIs will be dealt with. Yes, the, the UK um, interministerial meeting of agriculture, food, rural affairs ministers have agreed that the best approach, given the volume of legislation to move forward, to give functioning rule books would be to take forward UK wide SIs across a number of areas. So that has been agreed at ministerial level by the four regional ministers, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Just, I mean, in terms of SIs with, you know, that have an impact here in the north, uh, can the committee do anything other than make a recommendation? And I mean, what happens if a minister and a committee are both against an SI? Will it be implemented here anyway? I have to say, it depends. This is all running on a very tight time scale, as I said to you. I think there is a risk that DEPRA will go ahead, as I outlined in my presentation, and make the SI anyway. And then if the committee and the minister were against that SI, we would have to take forward local legislation to redact those powers. Um, we haven't got to that position yet, Philip, so it's a bit untested. And I think all I can do is say that 
I think given the time scale and the fact that these are UK government SIs, there's a risk that could be made anyway. Okay. Okay. Um, so, any other members want to? Okay. So, okay. so Rosemary, um, I want to thank you for attending. Um, <coughs> this is uh, close session there for a moment to um, discuss our response to this briefing. So, uh, Rosemary, Kevin, thanks very much for your attendance. Um, can I ask the, the comms to be aware that we are going into private session now and please remove the members and all the members on the spotlight. And we'll be back in 10 minutes or so. Um, 10 minutes. This is 30. No briefing on the common organisation of the markets and agriculture products. Uh, uh, pages 186 to 189 in your pack is the, the memo, um, another memo 190 to 192, correspondence in the department 193 to 195, a summary of the changes made by the SIs of 196 to 197, and there's further questions uh, at page 16 to 7 of the table pack. I'd like to welcome by Starleaf Colette McMaster, the Director of Sustainable Agri-Food Development, and Elaine McCrory, Head of Agri-Food um, Brexit uh, 1. Uh, I want to remind members that the AGS04, the Common Organisation of the Markets, Agriculture and Products, um, EU Agri-Food 2020, is reserved. The has not been asked for its opinion on this SA. It's provided, it's, it's provided for information only, and it causes implications for other the other SIAGS05. Can I ask a vital and uh, whistle to begin the presentation, please? I'm not here yet. Clap, Nillian. Did you tell Combs to come back? Yeah. Hmm. I know. A few hours, right? Yeah, I'll give them a few minutes. I'll go and get one of the staff to get them a ring. Okay. Get those meeting over yet, sir? Do you want to just cover the rest of the agenda? Correspond or correspond or I'll be online. Okay. Okay, folks, whilst we're waiting for the uh, official statement, um, we just maybe deal with um, a couple of items um, which are waiting. Correspondence, uh, pages 204 to 207 of your pack. Are you content to action the correspondence suggested in the index page? Of 199 to 200. Yeah. I was okay with that. And the forward work program, um, the the draft program is page 209 to 216, that covers the period of the 24th of September to 22nd of October, based on the committee taking the thematic approach to the SIs. Stella, do you want to take us through the forward work program? Yes, um, members, you, you um, had heard from Rosemary there that the uh, department proposed. A thematic approach to looking at um, everything to do with EU exit. So, for example, next week's an, uh, an example, it would be all on fisheries. So, you'd hear about fishery trade negotiations, you'd hear about uh, fisheries um, regulations coming to the Northern Ireland Assembly, and you'd hear about all the fishery regulations that are going to go through West Westminster, and that they feel that that would be a better approach than. Uh, taking it by business group area, although you have, of course, the committee has written and asked for a written briefing on it by business group area. So that would be the 1st of October. The 2nd of October would be on chemicals and waste. So that would be the, the what you would, you, would, you would be looking at on the 8th of October, um, and that's, that's how it would go. So that's, um, we'd also be looking at October monitoring right next week, um, hopefully. That's um, up to you to decide whether, right now, whether you want to follow that thematic approach um, or not. And we again to realise that although we put in a number of SIs there, this is all very indicative at the minute. Everything is subject to change, 
I find I'm even finding it hard to plan next week's meeting from week to week, let alone from normally having two or three weeks in advance and knowing what people want. Um, so that's it's, I'm looking for basically committee agreement to that approach to begin with. For what it's worth, I, 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 I find the thematic approach is better. You know, at least you can zero on, on the details of one particular theme or topic, you know, like instead of moving around the various areas, you know. So that, that would be my view, yeah. anyway, and I don't know what do you That's think. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yep. 100%. 100%. Yep. yep. Yeah. Okay, so the thematic approach is better. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And then the only other thing then to bring up is that you're having evidence with the four ports. Four ports will be coming to the committee on the 8th of October. Belfast, Derry, Lauren and Warren Point all have now confirmed. But we've been asked by one of the ports if you could be a bit more specific on what you would like them to discuss. So there was um, some suggestions there, Chair, that you maybe want to read out if you want to. Yeah. Some of the, some of the, some of the issues that have been outlined is their assessment of the state of readiness for 1st of January, uh, the many aspects of cause and concern. Um, the SPS checks will be required in goods moving from um, from across water to here. Can the ports any, any any concerns that they would have in terms of these checks and what goods they have most concerns about? Clarity that they still need on how traffic will flow between Britain and <coughs> after transition and some indication of the amount and type of traffic flowing between here and Britain. And what contact have they had with DERA regarding what facilities each port requires? Are they able to list these and estimate the costs? And will, most importantly, will they be delivered by January? The IT system, which was mentioned earlier, um, how will this be relevant in, here in the north? And the, tra the Trader uh, Support Service, this government initiative for businesses moving goods from here to Britain. Um, uh, will this be of help regarding uh, paperwork? So far enough, what else do you feel might be required? And their opinions on the dual VAT system. Also, the main concerns and hope for the internal market bill and how this might impact on the operation of the ports. If you don't mind, committee, if I add in that there, concern was raised about the Warren Point port and the, the um, yes. presence of the SNSA in, in the vicinity of it. <laughs> Remember anything else that they'd want to raise? You know, obviously, I suppose. You know, things can be raised on the day, but I think it would be helpful if there's anything particular now you want to include, just speak up now. Um, but I wouldn't prohibit you raising something whenever they do come. No. No. So, members okay with that, that, that those proposed sort of areas to cover? And the rest of the mention there? Okay. Are, 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 they're are, here, yes. They're here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi. Right. Okay, uh, we can go back now to the departmental briefing. Uh, item 8 on your agendas, the uh, common organisation of the markets and agriculture products. Um, uh, Colette and Elaine, you are very welcome here. Um, and uh, I ask you the, the opportunity to begin your presentation and members will have um, some questions, no doubt, after you conclude. Thank you. Um, Chair, I'm not sure whether I'm... Oh, sorry. Chair, I'm not sure whether I'm already um, in the meeting or not. Sorry. Yes. It's Colette McMaster here, Chair. Yes. Can you see us or hear us? Um, I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Right. Sorry. Thank, thank you, Chair. I'll I'll just start with the presentation of that. It's okay. Okay with you? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to the committee today about two DEFRA statutory instruments which we'll refer to as SIs. First, SI title is Common Organisation of the Markets in Agricultural Product, Producer Organisations and Wine Amendment, etc. EU Exit Regulations 2020, or AGS 04. The second SI title is the Agriculture Payments Amendment, etc. EU Exit Regulations 2020, or AGS 05. Elaine McCrory, who's the main policy lead for most of the changes proposed in these SIs, is also on, online, as you're aware. You heard an update from my colleague, Rosemary Agnew, earlier um, on the department's approach to EU exit updates and the secondary legislation programme. I understand the committee is considering its role in respect of these UK-wide SIs. 
I know you wish to consider your role, um, but I'm seeking the committee's agreement that the provisions in the devolved SI AGS05 be extended to Northern Ireland. These two SIs are being made by DEFRA on a UK-wide basis as part of the 2020 legislative programme aimed at ensuring a functioning statute book of some degree of risk is in place at the end of the transition period, 31st of December 2020. Both SIs are due to be led in draft form at Westminster on the 30th of September, with debates in both houses to follow in the autumn. My sincere apologies that the committee has had such limited time to consider the information shared on the devolved SI AGS05. Their officials only received near final drafts of the SIs from DEFRA last week, and indeed received notice of a further minor amendment yesterday. Turning to the territorial extent, the devolved SI AGS05 has been drafted on a UK-wide basis. This is because it would not be possible to have standalone Northern Ireland legislation made in time for the end of the transition period due to the complexity of the changes needed, the volume of the legislation to be moved in a tight time frame, and the limited resources to make the necessary amendments on a Northern Ireland only basis. Making the SI on a UK wide basis also helps ensure a consistent approach across the four nations where appropriate. I'll turn the matter of equality and human rights screening in relation to the UK SIs. Consider the FFG-related programme of legislation with devolved content being made at Westminster before the end of the transition period, in terms of its equality impacts, and concluded that these amendments are required to implement the withdrawal agreement and, on the whole, to make existing legislation operable. They would have no significant impact on equality or human rights. And as my colleague Rosemary New committed earlier this morning, will provide that information to the committee. I'll now give you an overview of the content of the SIs, the proposed changes they make, and a summary of the rationale for making this legislation on a UK-wide basis. We'll reflect the views of the committee to the Minister, so that it may inform his response to DEFRA on extending the provisions in this SI to Northern Ireland. First, a bit of background then to the EU exit legislation. The European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 converts EU law as it stands at the end of the transition period into EU into sorry UK domestic law. This legislation is known as retained direct EU legislation. Powers in the EU Withdrawal Act enable amendments to be made to EU and UK law to ensure that such legislation can work properly in the context of the UK no longer being a member of the EU. Over the last Two years, DEFRA has developed a programme of legislation to amend retained EU law on the basis that the UK would be leaving the EU without a negotiated deal. It has been necessary to revisit the previous exit legislation to ensure that it reflects the withdrawal agreement, including the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. As detailed in the Gallows letter of 18th of September to the committee, the two SIs we're presenting on today deal with issues in relation to the Common Market Organisation. CMO and the Common Agricultural Policy CAP, and in particular the governance of Rural Development Programme RDP and CMO funding schemes. Geographical indications GIs in the wine sector and producer organisations. The SIs address operability issues in the retained EU and domestic legislation to reflect updates to EU and domestic law during the intervening period, correct errors and terminology previous EU exit SIs, and, as noted, ensure alignment with provisions of the withdrawal agreement, including the protocol. Moving now to summary of the proposals, AGS 05, first of all, the focus of our discussion today is on this devolved SI, AGS 05. The bulk of this SI deals with operability changes to the retained EU regulations dealing with financing, management and monitoring of CAP, former CAP funding schemes, chiefly EU Regulation 1306 2013 and its supplementing and implementing regulations, known collectively as horizontal regulations. Horizontal regulations set the rules for funding, checks, penalties for non compliance, etc., which were previously incorporated into UK law as a Brexit day and amended in relation to direct payment schemes. 
via the direct payments to farmers, Legislative Continuity Act 2020, and a number of associated SIs, the latter have previously been considered by the committee. However, the horizontal regulations also cover the financing, management, and monitoring arrangements for the RDP and CMO schemes. AGS05 therefore makes amendments to the retained horizontal regulations for the purposes of RDP and CMO. The SI amends previous EU exit SIs made by DEFRA on a UK wide basis. The main effect of the SI is to strip out any references to the direct payments regime which is catered for separately. These are largely technical amendments, which will have little practical effect on the operation of the current schemes, such as skill milk. AGS also makes a small number of additional amendments to ensure rural development rules continue to function effectively at the end of the transition period. The SI also includes a few other amendments to previous exit SIs, to correct minor errors in relation to the operation of public intervention and private storage aid schemes, to change exit day to IP completion day, that is the end of the implementation or transition period, to make consequential amendments and to revoke a number of previous direct payments SIs which are no longer needed. Finally, the SI rules forward and amend some provisions on notifications of agricultural marketing information compelling this information to be provided to UK authorities rather than to the Commission. Going now to AGS04, this is a UK-wide SI containing purely reserved provisions and therefore Northern Ireland consent is not being sought. We have, however, brought this SI to the attention of the committee because the changes it makes in relation to producer organisations are closely linked to those in AGS05. These changes have potentially significant implications for Northern Ireland, which the committee will wish to be aware of. It's because of its links to AGS04 that we consider default SI to be category three and offer this presentation to the committee. So talking now a bit about producer organizations, I'll outline the changes made by these SIs in relation to the producer organization's POs. These changes largely replicate proposed changes to EU retained legislation in respect of POs that were previously linked to UK wide made affirmative SIs, one reserved, one default, which fell as they were not debated on time in both houses of Parliament. AGS05 contains non controversial operability amendments that relate mainly to the rules around the head office, membership, operational programmes and funding of POs and incorporate current UK rules on these into domestic law. However, the default SI needs to be considered with the reserved SI AGS04, which deals with provisions in respect of recognition and funding of POs, specifically transnational producer organisation TPO. Under the current EU regime, producers from other EU countries may come together in transnational POs. As a result of the proposed amendments to retained EU legislation contained in AGS04, future scope to form TPOs will be removed from the UK statute book. In addition, changes will be made to the formula for calculation of age TPO so that it's based on the value of the marketed production for UK members alone. These policy changes will impact TPOs across the UK. Therefore, as a result of proposed changes in the legislation, the PO based in Northern Ireland could potentially lose a significant proportion of its future funding in respect of its non-UK members. Recognition of POs is a matter reserved to the DEFRA Secretary of State. While funding of POs is largely a devolved matter, the international relations element of funding for non-UK members makes this an accepted matter under the Northern Ireland Act, and this is the reason for inclusion of these changes in the SI. Timing of the impact of these changes is currently uncertain. This is because Article 138 of the Withdrawal Agreement provides for EU law to continue to apply to the UK in respect of certain programmes and activities committed under the EU's multi-annual financial framework 2014 to 2020 or previous financial perspective after 31st of December 2020, 
until their closure or the application of Article 138. This provision applies to rural development measures and also certain CMO schemes, including aid to fruit and vegetable peels, which have five year operational programs. During preparation of the previous DEFRA exercise, which made similar changes to routine law, there are is concerns about the potential impact of removal of TP provision from the ground. There are ministers get worked on these issues. As previously indicated, these are reserved matters and Northern Ireland consent is not being sought to the territorial extent of HSO4. We're briefing the committee on this matter for information. The remainder of AGSO4 deals with reserved provisions in relation to protected geographical indications, protected designations of origin and traditional terms in the wine sector. The changes made by the SSI simply align appeals procedures in relation to decisions made by the DEFRA Secretary on wine GIs with those for other GI categories. Since GI legislation is included in Annex 2 of the Northern Ireland Protocol, the changes in the SSI apply to GIs protected market. Main legislation, main legislative changes in relation to GIs will be made via a separate SI on which the department hopes to brief the, in the next few weeks. Finally, AGSO4 makes minor corrections to previous DEFRA exit SI, changing exit day to IP completion date. Now, uh, conclusion, so to sum up, Changes to be made with the evolved SI, AGSO5 are necessary to ensure that ETN law in relation to the financing, management, monitoring of former CMO and RDP schemes, as well as some aspects of the schemes themselves, function effectively at the end of the transition period. Subject to the views of the committee, the minister is minded to give consent to extending provisions in AGSO5 to Northern Ireland. The SI has a scheduled laying date of Westminster of 30 September, and therefore the Minister will wish to respond to this DEFRA current report as soon as he had a chance to the committee's view. I trust the committee's found the presentation useful and that it's helped to clarify the rationale for extending the SI to Northern Ireland. I'll be happy with Elaine to take any questions or provide further details if you specific areas of interest. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, uh, Colette. Um, I suppose the, the one thing I will ask, if you're looking through the, the, the AG5 and AGS 5 of 4, I didn't see any reference to the Rural Needs Act, you know, um, which we have obviously implemented here. How, how can we be certain that um, these, this SA uh, proposal uh, will um, abide by the um, rural proofing, which is a legislative requirement here in the North? <coughs> Um, AGSO4, I think, Chair, you were asking about AGSO4. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, yep. Yeah. AGSO4 is the reserve, well, it's a reserve SI, it's a DEFRA SI that's um, being brought forward by the DEFRA Secretary of State. That means it's not um, it's not part of the legislation that is uh, it's covered by the Rural Needs Act in Northern Ireland, which relates to um, Northern Ireland legislation that we would bring forward um, in like Northern Ireland or changes that we would make in Northern Ireland. Okay. Yeah, uh -huh. thank you for your presentation. AGS 05, what, um, what would happen, or like your thoughts, further information, what would happen or occur if the committee indicated that it would prefer that the legislation route or the provisions was made in Northern Ireland rather than elsewhere? Well, I think as, as Marie mentioned earlier, um, the reason that um, reason that we have, we're making UK, UK wide SIs or including the Northern Ireland provisions is um, for a number of other well, number of reasons. One of them is to ensure a consistent approach across the board nations um, on common issues on, on these have been um, traditionally these are UK wide matters um, and also really very much to do with the fact that at this stage in the in the program um, towards the end of the transition period um, there is very little time left in order to make 
separate down to the Northern Ireland legislation. Um, the concern, I suppose, from our point of view is if say, the provision for Northern Ireland were not included in the KYSI, SI, that um, would not, may not be possible to have them in place by the end of the transition period. Okay. And are the SIs and issues raised in other devolved administrations? Are being considered in other devolved administrations in a similar way to being considered here in that the um in terms of the, the scrutiny of their devolved um parliaments, the SIs themselves are not available and they're considering the content. Um, but the intention is that the these are going to be go forward as UK wide SIs, which will include Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England. And um, I'll just invite Elaine at any point if she would, wants to come in on the back of anything I'm saying, just to clarify further. We need to. Uh, Thank you. Let me get a few minutes. Elaine's frozen out. No, I'm okay. I have enough. Yeah. yeah. Patsy, Patsy, do you want to come in there? We can't get you, Elaine. We've lost you. We can't get you, Elaine. Patsy, do you want to come something there, Lady? Patsy. Patsy, can you hear us? Did you? Oh, yes, Chair. Sorry, I thought you were waiting for Elaine to come in there. Uh, we'll okay, um, to be back. So hopefully she'll be back in again. That's okay. That's okay. If we could just ask Colette there, um, I'm looking, maybe you could give me an insight into or examples of what the producer organisations are, but uh, as we were talking there about, uh, about Scotland, how things are over there, um, I see there in paragraph two of your, your uh, annex that uh, change relating to rules and recognition of, of uh, producer organisations with the Reverend Mother UK, Scotland disputes this reservation. Have you any idea of, of why you are maybe an, uh, maybe a, your first answer to the type of these producer organisations, whether they're transnational or producer whatever type of producer organisations they are, that may give me some insight as to why Scotland disputed it, and, and presumably that dispute will roll on through to the Scottish Assembly. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to, to comment on on the Scottish position on this. Um, okay. What we know is that we we've taken legal advice here, and we are we have no question about the the fact that it's a reserved matter for Northern Ireland in line with with our own legislation position. Um, so uh, Scotland may are making their own. Um, their legislation is slightly different the basis of their legislation, so they are, they are making an argument on that basis. But for ourselves in Northern Ireland, it's on, on basis of our own legal advice. It's, it's, it's not a question that it's a reserve matter for ourselves. Um, did you want me to say a bit about producer organisations? Yes, I just want to know what this affects. Producer organisations is it just a, a general term, or is it specific organisations that? that this covers? Yeah, there are um, specific, um, it's a specific operational program, it's a specific uh, support of producer organisations themselves uh, in general, as a general thing, they can be recognised across a number of sectors and that includes posterity right. purposes, they help strengthen the position of farmers and supply chain and they provide a means to farmers and others to share their knowledge technical information, reduce their costs, save economies of scale, manage risks and so on. So they also provide a mechanism for promoting and assisting with good practice in relation to environmental issues. Um, they're, they're granting exemption from new competition rules, allowing collective bargaining and prices. So they are a specific new program and um, we have a small number of producer organisations in Northern Ireland, um, but uh, the, the, and they are in the horticulture area. So there's a small number here at the moment, but uh, they, there may be more in future. And in fact, it's something that 
is probably there are benefits in producer organizations as I've outlined in terms of the collaborative working and so on. And uh, so um, the, the effect of this legislation is to ensure that the operational programs can function. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Colette. Thank you. Okay, Morris. That's it, Morris. Morris. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much, um, Colette, for your presentation. Can, can I ask just one question? Both, uh, both of these SAs appear, uh, by what I have heard this afternoon, to be an adoption of EU rules into UK law. Uh, but can I ask? What impact both SIs may have on the Northern Ireland Protocol, and what impact will both SIs have on the Internal Market Bill, or what impact would in the Internal Market Bill have on the SIs uh, AGS04 and AGS05? Give me a long down on that, please. Okay, so. Um... Right. Well, the first part of that then was to do with the Northern Ireland Protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, let me deal with that first. Um, under the terms of the protocol, Northern Ireland will continue to be bound by EU regulations governing certain goods until such times as the Northern Ireland Executive democratically decides to leave the arrangement. GIs are a reserve matter. AGS04 includes some content on geographical indications of GIs. Um, on the appeal procedures, for example, that reflects the protocol and it will only apply to decisions made by the Deputy Secretary of State in relation to protection of the AGS 5 makes minor amendments to legislation regarding funding schemes, which are largely out with the protocol and intersect all policy. Therefore, Northern Ireland ministers are being asked to provide consent to enable DEFRA to lay the legislation. So that's on the, uh, the protocol. Maybe you'd asked about the impact of the Internal Market Bill. Yeah. Um, I'll say a little about that. Um, so expenditure under the CMO and rural development and direct payments to farmers may be covered in any UK subsidy control regime. Mm -hmm. The bill reserves powers the UK government in relation to a UK subsidy control regime, but it does not permit one. And the issue of controls will be on the subsidies in the UK will be subject to consultation at a later date. Um, the UK government has issued a statement that after the end of the transition period provided by WTO subsidy rules, which are looser than the UK, the EU state aid regime, but the consultation to follow whether a more restrictive state aid regime should be put in place. The state aid, aid rate rules will continue to apply in Northern Ireland, which will include a limit on the point of can be given to farmers. Our interest is that state aid and GB is not more generalised or trade distorting compared to what can be provided in Northern Ireland in order to avoid the competitiveness of our businesses and the GB market being adversely affected. Um, that's a little on the hook, but there's specific questions that's probably something happy to follow up with. Um, yeah. we, we have to reach our, um, our time limit here. We have to be early here to the NAR, NAR committee in here in 10 minutes and we're going to have to clean down as well. So um, we're going to have to just uh, close the proceedings here. Um, there's no more option and we can discuss about how we complete the remainder of today's business um, whenever we, we conclude. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? Okay, so uh, th thank you Colette, sorry for cutting you off there, but we're, we're under instructions to get to, to get, get out here to make way for the next, uh, the next group, but we will, we will be, be revisiting this again, no doubt. Uh, so thank you very much Colette. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, folks, we're, we're going to just close off here. Okay, what's the meeting? That's the meeting finished. Just we're going into closed session just for two minutes. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.